most accepted workout programs give you results. Most of them work. None of them work forever. And of course, some of them work longer than others. I think it's important to communicate because there's so many different workout plans that are out there. Mm. Lots and of evangelists too. I feel like you're works. trying to justify your bullshit bro split right now. So. No, that, although, <laughs> although <laughs> this guy that did make me think setting of this. Guys, I have an idea. <laughs> setting the table right here. That did make me think of this. No, because you'll see lots of, and I say accepted, like, you know, workout programs that lots of people do, lots of people swear by, and they're very different from other workout programs. You're like, well, how's this possible? Which one works? Which one doesn't work? Um, they all they all can definitely work, but none of them work forever. I think that's the most important thing to consider is that if you do the same thing for too long, regardless of how good the programming is, it won't work. And then on the flip side, if something is novel, so long as it's appropriate, meaning it's not like overtraining you and beating you up, you know, past your your capacity, if it's novel, it'll probably get your body to respond. And that's the that's those are the two most important things to consider. I think to I think you could add to that and say almost everything works, but uh, there definitely is a hierarchy of which workouts are more superior than others. Of course, like mm -hmm. some workouts, just like exercises. There's certain like doing. Well, what any, are all the downstream effects? Doing any exercise safely is probably good and healthy for you, yeah. but that doesn't mean that there's not other exercises that are better than that exercise. Yeah, right? and so. that's why I said accepted because you know there's workouts out there that are just terrible or just across the board. Yeah. But uh, when I say accepted, I mean the ones that tend to be done by lots of people. So you have like your bro split, like you just mentioned, right? Powerlifting workouts. You have strongman type workouts. You have traditional full body style type workouts. It's like they all exist. They've all been done by thousands and thousands of people. Yeah. And lots of people swear by them. But, um, it, you know, it's important, if, especially if you're somebody who plans on doing this for a long time, understand that if you change your routine and it's novel, so long as it's appropriate, you're going to get some results. But also understand that no matter what you do, how great it is, no matter how awesome your workout is, at some point, it's going to stop working. And that doesn't matter what the program is. At some point, it'll just stop working. Even my butts and guts program. I mean, <laughs> did you ever yeah. run a butts and guts? I did. I did. <laughs> you did? Yeah, yeah. Butts and guts? Yeah, butts oh and guts. Oh, my gosh. You remember great, when, great do you remember, so you were around, I don't know if Justin was around for this. It was it used to be really popular in Sal's era, in my era, 24 Fitness, where I think it was once a quarter, we used to do the seminars. And the company would send you a box of like a t-shirt to like hype oh, it up and like all kinds of material. That must have happened right after I left. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I thought that was goes all the way back to because I think they started to phase it out when um when Justin was kind of coming on board. But I mean, they were they would always have some like gimmicky name like that, and that was like the theme of it to get everybody to come in for free for the seminar. And I had to put together some sort of an hour talk around butts and guts and give demos but, but yeah. then your goal was to of course book some assessments yeah yeah right get out get as many people to the free seminar then hopefully book as many people as you could on assessments with your trainers and then turn it into something yeah. very successful yeah. I mean, no no the reason well. why i'm bringing this up is uh well there was a study there was a meta analysis done on volume by brad i hope i'm saying his last name Schofield. Schofield, yeah yeah smart guy really i mean one of the mm -hmm. top researchers when it comes to strength training and in his in his meta analysis the conclusion was that Regardless of whether or not you work a body part once a week or three days a week, the results will be very similar so long as the volume is equated, so long as the volume is the same. Now, that's true, but the reason why we tend to advocate for full body style workouts for most people is because behaviors and lifestyles typically means uh, or usually results in the fact that you'll miss a workout if you're doing a, a, you know one body part a day, you miss that and that's it. You're done for the week versus full body. You get to hit that body part again. Um, people tend to not hit with hit the body part with sufficient intensity. Plus, it's hard to equate volume completely because let's say you work your chest twice a week and you do 10 sets each workout versus doing it for 20 sets in one workout. Even if the exercises are the same, if all 20 sets are done in that same workout, you're not going to be nearly as strong at the end of the workout. So you can take the load off the volume equation. Now it's less volume, right? So so, uh, you know, uh, but that being said, um, like you mentioned, I'm doing this bro split this week just because it's so different. I've never, mm -hmm. I haven't done like a, like a classic one body part a day workout in probably 15 years. And it was Sunday and I'm like, you know what? I haven't done that. And like, let me just, let's do it. It's going to be different. Let's see what happens. And, um, I mean, it's definitely different. The pump is definitely intense. Um, you know, it's, it gives me some nostalgia for how I used to work out when I was a kid. Mm. I could see how this will probably work for me for a few weeks, but then I'll have to switch back. But it did remind me, it's like, it's it's important to communicate this to people 
that um, things typically work, but nothing works forever. And then, of course, some things work longer. Have you ever done that? Bro split? Like that, like a single body part. Like chest, back, shoulders. I mean, I probably did when I was in the 24-hour fitness setting a few times. Yeah, and you worked out with me or something? Yeah, and I worked out. I think <laughs> you're the one that, you're that forced probably to. <laughs> like, put me through that bullshit. He's like, what are we doing today? I'm like, chest. Yeah. <laughs> what else? To Just the point where more, like, I walk chest. out and I couldn't even like <laughs> hug anybody. or <laughs> I was like, what is this? Yeah, because that used to be a big thing was just like you wanted to destroy yeah. that body part. And I yeah. knew that was like part of the whole bodybuilder kind of culture at one point was just like, if you're not like unable to walk the next day from leg day, then you're not doing it right. Well, well honestly, it once a week, it, well, you know? uh, the, also the, like my understanding as, as a young, even as a young trainer, I didn't, I didn't fully grasp the, the recovery process, the adaptation process. Yep. Like I didn't understand the science like I do today. I, I really thought that, the more damage I induced and the more rest I could give, the more muscle I would mm -hmm. build. I really think, and I calories, right? It was like, eat your, eat enough calories. You train as hard as you can to do as much damage to the muscle as possible. And then allow it to rest as much as you can without going too long. Like, cause I remember reading studies that said like, uh, atrophy doesn't really set in until three to four days, uh, post recovery. Meaning if I'm sore, for three to four days. It's not until another three or four days after that does atrophy yeah. even begin to happen. Therefore, as long as I hit a muscle group once every eight days, I'm good to go, especially if I get it hard. And so that was kind of like the training philosophy was crush it and then eat and rest as much as possible. And that would build the most muscle. Yeah. I think it can work if you're advanced enough to be able to hit the body part with sufficient control and intensity mm -hmm. and consistency and consistency. You can't miss a workout. You miss one workout. There's your back workout for the week. Now you're screwed, right? Yeah. You can never miss a workout. You also have to be able to pick the right exercises. Cause what a lot of people do when they do this one body part a day type of thing is they'll do like two good exercises. <laughs> and the rest are these fluff movements mm -hmm. uh, that don't have a ton of, of value. Um, and I do think now, I, but I, on the flip side, there's value in like really maximizing the, the waste, you know, byproducts, right? The waste buildup, the pump, uh, the ability to really squeeze and, and contract a muscle. Uh, you know, I think there's some value in that as well. So definitely some value, but for the average person, it just usually isn't as effective because it's so, just too much. They don't, they don't, uh, do the best exercises. Like we said, you tend to miss workouts. So for most people, full body, just across the board, but there is that those people at the end is 10% where this can be valuable, but it, especially well, if it's novel. Especially if it's novel. Yeah, well, that's, I guess, uh, was going to be my point was the novelty factor because of uh, the fact of, so for me being introduced to that kind of training, like opened up a lot of these like angles and movements yeah. and exercises, like I never would have pursued, right? Like I, there was, it was just meat and potatoes constantly. Like here's the barbell lifts for that. Here's the dumbbell lifts for that. And that's it. Right. Yeah. And then there's all these different machines and cables and things uh, to, to provide a different kind of stimulus. So maybe like weaving in and out in terms of uh, me being exposed to like a new stimulus was beneficial. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I don't know. So it's interesting since, out of the three of us, I probably trained the bro split way, single muscle, uh, the longest. The longest. Yeah. And the irony of that is I can't imagine me doing that right now or anytime soon because I can't even remember the last time that I actually consistently trained five to six days a week in a, a month straight or more. Like I haven't had that kind of consistency in my lifting in a really long time. It would be an inappropriate. It would scale, totally be right? inappropriate. Yeah. It would be a terrible idea. Like it would like to do that now I would. So for me, I would first have to prove consistency for at least a couple months of yeah. five to six day a week type of training mm -hmm. consistently before I go, okay, now let me well, split it up. Core value you want to put at the top of your hierarchy is, is like how, how can I, can, if, am I going to be able to keep performing this and, and, you know, adhere to this, uh, for the amount of time, like possible for me to actually reap benefit. From I it? actually think that we talk about like how, uh, the consistency of, or I mean, how our, our bodies as we've gotten older is stayed, you know, I stay fitter longer, right. Without with least, it with, sticks around. Yeah. For less, for less work. I really think a lot of that has to do too, with switching out of the single body part. Cause when I look back at like my entire career of lifting, I'm not any more or less consistent today really than any other time. And really what it is, is that I've switched to a more full body or at least splitting the upper lower body type of approach. And so I just, even when I'm 
inconsistent, I still am getting more work done than I ever did before. I can't. And so looking back, I go, yeah, like, you oh. work out three days, you hit the whole body three times. Yeah. If you work out with the bro split and you miss a workout or two workouts, there's whole swaths of your body that you haven't been able to hit. And the natural thing that people do is gravitate towards the things they're good at and they like. And yep. so those are the things that continue to get more attention. Yeah, they never the, miss arm day. That's right. And then yeah. the stuff that you don't it's like. The behavioral element, right? Yeah. There. You So, man, I it it's really a very small part of the population that I would ever really recommend now, which is crazy because I'm admittedly was – like that for a, that's over bo bodybuilding had such a strong influence on strength training that that's how you did strength training. That's mm -hmm. really, uh, unless you were an athletic trainer and understood that mm -hmm. when you were a trainer, when I was a trainer, everything I knew about strength training was yeah, from, a lot bodybuilding. Of it came from bodybuilding. Yeah. So that's how I trained people. I trained people body parts at a time mm -hmm. and full body was just a, a game changer. Well, that's results. how the gyms are set up. I mean, they you're had right. All of those machines deliberately sectioned out. So you work on your, this body part, then you go to this one. Yep. Yep. And, and that's the influence of bodybuilding. But to give you guys kind of, or, or to give the audience uh, kind of a timeline of how this has progressed for me, because again, this is very novel. I'll probably do it for three, four weeks and I'll go to something else, but it starts. I did a maps anabolic style workout for a while MAPS anabolic style workouts, I tend to get really strong. Um, then I did uh, MAPS 15-ish. It was probably 25 minutes a day. I hit a PR and deadlift. I got really, really strong doing that. But once I start to lift real heavy, I start to notice my joints or whatever. So then I switched to more of a MAPS aesthetic where I'm going full body with focus sessions type of stuff. Then I did uh, uh, maybe an upper lower split for a few weeks. And now I'm doing this real classic bro split. Very different feel though. Like it's, it's, I don't pay attention to the weight at all. In fact, if you see me working out, I'm constantly going lighter because mm. the goal is to feel the muscle. And if I do a set and I go, I bet I could feel it more if I, if I took 20 pounds off. So I'm constantly going lighter and lighter trying to feel. So it's very, very bodybuilder ish. There's, um, there's almost no emphasis on how much weight uh, I'm lifting. In fact, I did back today and I did deadlifts at the end of my back workout because mm. I wanted to get a really hard pump and get fatigue, go light with the deadlift and squeeze at the top, you know, which is not how you traditionally would deadlift. Yeah. So it's a very different feel. Um, I get real sore. I'll tell you that much. I'm like, yeah. my chest is now, is really sore from working out yesterday. Whereas the full body stuff, I almost never get sore. When, uh, Doug, how, how much longer till we can start to reveal the new program that's coming out? I mean, this is, it's around the corner right now, right? Yeah, so we're going to be launching in a couple of weeks here. Yeah, um, can't say yeah. too much more. Can't right say too much yet, Come but on. there is something coming. Come on, let's, let's just say I'm, I haven't been this excited for a maps program yeah. in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we say that a lot. No, 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 no. Yeah. This one really excited. <laughs> no, I am very excited. <laughs> really excited. They'll know why when we release it. They'll yeah. know why. It's it, this one was uh, this one's going to be a lot. Can of we fun. can we at least say that you're the cover yeah, model? This face, we haven't done that in a long time. That's so weird. The, uh, huh? that's so weird. Yeah, you're the, yeah, you're the cover model. Yeah, uh, for some reason yes. the marketers are like, let's put the old guy on the cover yeah. and see what happens. Like, the <laughs> no, there's a reason there. for that. You'll you'll find out. You know. No, I, I'm I, I'm actually really Rocking excited about this one steel. too. So yeah. All right, everybody. Today's giveaway is Maps Powerlift. Here's how you can win the program. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this video. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. And if you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Also, we got a sale going on this month. Three workout programs are all 50% off. Okay, so three of them, half off. MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Hit. If you're interested in any one of those, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Anyway, I, uh, speaking of strength training, there was a meta analysis that was just done on strength training and health. Did, oh, that's the one I sent you, right? It is, yes. Yeah. Uh, and you know what I like Thank about this? Thank you for crediting me. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You didn't do the study, but no. you did send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> it got sent to me. Yeah. The middle man. <laughs> you know what I, he middled it. You know what I like about this is that- um, It's a meta analysis too. Well, right? I, so like, I like that it's a meta analysis, but what I really like is, you know, it wasn't that long ago where you could not, um, you could not find a study on strength training and health. You just couldn't. None of them existed. It was it was all about performance, performance, and, yeah. and maybe then there was muscle gain, and then fat loss finally followed. But none really done on health. In fact, when we were trainers in the late '90s, early 2000s, almost nobody advocated for strength training for health or longevity. It just wasn't even in the conversation. There yeah. were no studies done on it. Nobody talked about it. People did strength training because they wanted to look good. 
but it was never in the conversation of health or longevity at all. Well, this meta-analysis came out and it showed that strength training, okay, by itself resulted in a about a 17%, 17 to 20% reduction in all cause mortality. Wow. Just from strength training. That's cardiovascular disease, cancer, mm -hmm. and diabetes. So it affected all the chronic health issues. So that's a big drop from just strength training. Yeah. Now you combine that with diet, lifestyle, all that stuff. And, and sauna. Something. Wasn't sauna up there? Wasn't that one sauna up there? Sauna was up there. Sauna yeah. was up there with a like really high as really far high. as all-cause mortality, well, right? It mimics exercise. Right? And it's got vasodilating effects and yeah. it strengthens the heart. It was like 20, it was like 20% all-cause mortality. Yeah. Just from sauna use. I mean, so think about wild. that. Like do you just I think I feel like introducing like hot cold therapy with strength training two to three times a week, like talk about extreme health benefits for longevity. Dude, for longevity, if you just did strength training twice a week, walked every day, like mm -hmm. 10, 10 to 15,000 steps a day. There was another study done on walking that showed this like uh, reduction in all-cause mortality as the steps went up once it got to like 18,000 steps and there wasn't really more benefit. Yeah. But like, you know, 7,000 steps, 10,000 steps, 15,000 steps, more and more Maybe. benefit. So if you just walked every day, did some strength training twice a week, and you throw some sauna in there, man, you've got like 90%. It'd yeah. be interesting if if we ever got a good study where you took like your, you know, your David Sinclair's and your people out there that like really advocate for this longevity and like, you know, living as long as possible uh, and their methods versus like applying methods where you're strength training, you know, on top of that, where you're, the quality of life factor is something that we're evaluating. Yeah. So I, here's what I think it would be an interesting, say of those things, do you think that they are that profound or are we getting that deconditioned that that little bit of work is enough to make that big of a difference? That's it. Yeah. That's so it's it it's less that those things are so because obviously when you hear stuff like that in in in, in our space it's all uh, obviously it's beneficial to sell that hard like mm -hmm. look yeah. at it, like the stats on yeah. this is crazy, but one of the things I can't help but think it's like man is it really that profound or is it more we have gotten that deconditioned That's that it. lazy that out of it's, shape and unhealthy that simply making a few steps yeah. in the right direction health wise makes a dramatic difference That's what now. it is. I'll so give easy you, not to. Yes, I'll give you an analogy. It would be like taking a bunch of people who are vitamin D deficient, giving them vitamin D and then you'd see these profound effects. <laughs> and it's not because the vitamin D is a miracle compound, it's because they were deficient. Yeah. So the reason why strength training and walking have such a profound effect on our health is not because they're miracle, you know, things. It's because we don't do them. Yeah. So our health is poor because we don't. So when you do them, you get this huge effect. If you did them and you your, did them your right, your body's doing like more, starving for it. Yes. Like it's in other words, if you did the right amount, doing more at some point, you wouldn't get any more benefit. In fact, it probably start to get negative effects. Yeah. But you take the average person. I'm strength training twice a week. They're <laughs> huge, yeah, huge benefits because they do nothing. It doesn't even need to be that crazy intensive. No, and that's because they do they just do nothing at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I wanted to bring something up about one of our partners that I'm surprised you guys didn't know about because this has to do with uh, sports. This has to do with sports. <laughs> <laughs> sports. What's that? So Viore, right, you guys know that Viore ball. partnered with. Uh, let me get the right the name of the company. I pulled it up here. I know they're doing. Exos. They, they, I know they're doing. Anna. Oh, really? Oh, yes. No way. I didn't they partnered know that. up with Exos as the exclusive apparel partner. Okay. So break down Exos for me. So th that's that's a they help produce uh, elite talent through the combine. Yeah. In draft season, that's what it says. Yeah, they're here. very athletically driven, um, uh, functional fitness. Um, they're they're at the high level in terms of like somebody I would an athlete I would send through a programming like they had an actual facility here up in Mountain View Mountain View yeah, yeah. Mountain View that's how I'm familiar with them I don't know I, I had I knew a couple trainers that worked for them and they were always elite trainers they all had their CSCS and they were and they were centered around sports performance but I don't the cutting edge out of uh, any other kind of like methods but I don't know the origin of it yeah I don't know the origin of it who created it what, well all I read was I just I know, know they had a great reputation that they, they work with a lot of the NFL so yeah I mean, it was definitely a, a hot spot for um, 
for professional athletes to come in and train and get like kind of the best um, coaches that they could get exposed to for their and two they used they were like some of the first to use a lot of the sensor technology and things to manage stress. That's what it was. I yeah. remember that. So they adopted yeah. a lot of these the the latest technology. To yeah, they were like the first to use HRV athletes. and stuff like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they were really they early incorporated adopted. all of it. Yeah, I, I remember that too. You know, speaking of yours, since you brought them up, the you know uh, yesterday. Um, we, we shot some of those nutrition videos that you and I were doing and I didn't have, I had those olive pants of theirs and I was like, oh shit, I need, I want black on black. And Doug's like, oh, we have some pants here. And so I asked Jerry, Jerry gives them to me and I put them on. I'm like, what are these? I've never wore these before. They kind of look like the Sunday joggers, but they're not. They're even softer material. And they're the, what were they? The Pronto? The Ponto. Ponto. Are they Ponto joggers? Because Pon Ponto, there's a, several Pontos. Yeah. I don't know. Let me, so I think it was Ponto. Yeah, but no, but they there's I know you know how they have like they call it the Ponto Performance Pants. Yes, those ones. Mm -hmm. Man, those are like mm -hmm. pajama comfy. Yeah, they're super, super soft, super light, super soft. But then they, they also have kind of a fit, kind of like the Sunday joggers. They're not as thick of material and as as tight. They're a looser fit. I've never even tried those on before. Yeah, it's wild to see Viore yeah. cr just crushing, just absolutely crushing from where they started when we started working with them to it's now. It's bittersweet uh, yeah. for me. Yeah, why? Because we, we didn't get to invest? <laughs> yeah, we were so young when we met. Yeah, uh, you know, too like, early. We, I, I think we have this incredible model that we just timed horribly, right? Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I, literally, I mean, I I, like, I'm, I'm very proud that like, we, we got to a place speed. where yeah. we were smart, you know, financially and in a place to, to be able to invest capital in these brands that we're already excited about. But we literally missed the boat on two home mm -hmm. runs that we would have for sure been all over. And it would have would have done great. And it was before the peak of all these evaluations. And now these they're all so high. It's just like, dude, man, I got something for so you. It's a little bittersweet. Speaking for me. of investments, I just read this on uh, what page was it? It was uh, Insider Insider Business. Ch <laughs> You'll love this one. No oh, God. Chad GBT explains Warren Buffett's investment strategy and names two stocks that would align with the billionaire's portfolio. Wow. So, so are you doing stock predictions? So though? Does it does it give them? The, it, the two stocks or it no? did not. Uh, Although you could, you could, I think guess. you could go to our website and figure it out. Uh, but nonetheless, whoa. If chat GPT could do that, yeah. if you could pick the top investment people in the world and ask it to mirror yeah, them mi mimic and it. then give me stocks that would fit their strategy and then it picks them for you. Yeah. You have a financial advisor. So right I've, I've found, a, I found a few things that it actually, so it's interesting. It got, Maybe maybe because it asked about Warren Buffett. Yes. And there's a history of that it because, was prompted differently. But yeah, because I try to prompt it for some stock stuff, and it gave me a very similar response as like the gambling, like saying it said something like the stock market is so unpredictable that it can't, it couldn't mm. predict these. So I was like, oh, that sucks. Because I wanted to use it. it sounds for, like that's a get around, right? Yeah. yeah. So so uh, hey, Chad GPT, what would Warren Buffett? do right yeah. now in the market or something like that yeah um, yeah that's interesting because, i sent yeah. it to my cousins who are all Chad financial GPT, why did uh, bill gates just sell of his stock in um vaccines he sold his stock in vaccines is that true this is or what you, i are just you spreading I, rumors no i just look that up doug okay look it up and confirm he hasn't been wrong yet because I, ever, since those, ever since the peptides <laughs> <laughs> oh ever since pe <laughs> no, it's been there that. the whole time <laughs> 2000 episodes of accuracy. Yeah. He doesn't, he normally doesn't like, like double down, but what he does, he's on, he's on yeah. point. I, yeah. No, I guess anymore. I mean, it, I don't conveniently. Guess okay. So there's been, and now you, you start to see him in the public sphere with these videos where he's actually like, you know, criticizing the vaccines, which he was the biggest proponent of it, uh, f you know, years even before the pandemic. He's cool though. Now he, he, he apparently he uh, got he his made, bag. He made off. Okay. Yeah, uh, everybody has a, a Microsoft chip in their arm now. What does it say there, Doug? <laughs> yeah. According to this, Bill Gates, after reaping huge profits selling BioNTech shares, trashes effectiveness of COVID, yeah. COVID vaccines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. You, you, okay, so, you so, know, okay, I can't, he's smart. I can't wrap my brain around him, it's, right? So I have, I have a hard time. That's a hard one I know, for is me. I have a hard time criticizing him about financial moves when he's the largest philanthropist, right? In the world. In the world. Yeah. So he gives away more money than anybody else in the world. So I have a hard time hopping on the conspiracy theory. Justin said about to I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Just but, look, I, look into some of those charities. I, I, so, okay. What's happened with the experimentation? I oh, mean, I don't... I, I, I've heard that. I don't think that 
I don't think that uh, the, that story behind him aligns when you're when you're. Don't, I, I mean, right? I mean, yeah. Isn't I, that weird? I, I haven't looked deep enough into he it to have an opinion. Statements and some things. I, he's I said. know, but I'm here's the like, thing, though. I mean, God, everything I feel like it's is so distorted and manipulated. He does, and he does headlines. Say, he does say stupid stuff on diet, nutrition, and and you know, moving yeah, people. Yeah, I mean, I, a lot I, of people say a lot of stupid stuff. Yes, you know they do. Yes. So, you know, so I'm not saying that he's yeah, any yeah. dumber. He just says some stupid stuff. And by the way, I'm not defending Bill Gates for the people that are ready to jump down my throat right away. Hey, I know her. Speaking of conspiracy theories, you, you saw his wife when they interviewed her about his relationship with Epstein. You guys saw that, right? That's, yes. Yeah, yeah, she was like, I mean, they, they speculate. Oh, she, why they got she was like, I'm out. Like, right when she that came Cause out. Because Bill was like friends with Epstein. We yeah, Island. had pictures. And I, they asked his wife about it on an interview and you could tell she was like, oh, I don't like, know. Like, visibly disgusted. Yeah. Like, and then, then we cut the, like that, that almost, it was implied maybe that that contributed to their divorce. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's weird. But look, here's the deal. It's he's he's very smart with his investment because if you played it right, you're watching the media and you're buying shares in these in these vaccine companies because right, right. yes. they're being pushed, they're being pushed. And then you see the narrative start to change as and then you get out. The data goes, you, "Oh wait, it's not 90% dump. effective. Oh wait, it's 75%. Oh wait, it's oh wait, you can still Spread it to other people. It's business as usual. Uh oh, it's getting investigated for potential, you know, you know, in increasing blood clots and oh, myocarditis. That might be a thing. And now the, you know, people are saying I'm not going to get boosted with this very ineffective, crappy vaccine or whatever. So a lot of people are saying now. So he's smart to sell. It's just he's hard. Reading, yeah. He's seeing the media. You know what I thought was interesting was we we brought this up. Uh, uh, I think like last week we we had a little bit of a you know the vaccine talk. And I think I made a comment about uh, not hearing too many people that uh, that got it that now regret it. And we actually did you see all the comments? No, you got a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, no. And on the YouTube channel, I saw a lot of people uh, that had said that said, "Hey, openly, I I've taken two of them already, and I'm one of those people that would regret it now. Wish I didn't do it." Like, um, there's a lot of quiet people. It's even in, within my circle, I was telling you guys this when we were talking off air that I, I think the part that I'm most I, I'm really. I'm not. I'm not pissed. The the government and the uh, the the Pfizer and they're they're all. If you think that if you didn't think they were corrupt before this and stuff like that, then you've been walking around blind. So I I'm more upset at like my family and friends yeah. and the people that are connected to me that didn't haven't come forward and said they're sorry. Yeah. Like. How about how about the people that are like those are people the people I'm most upset like you got manipulated mm -hmm. by the narrative that was being pushed out there to a point where you were ostracizing some of your people that were in your own family and friends right. of yours that's fractured and relationships you, and you, that, yeah and you part. created this divide of it's us versus you type of thing and then now all this comes out and it's pretty goddamn obvious that if you're a healthy fit person who's under the age of 40 years old yeah. why would you even consider doing this and i and and even if you did that's your choice totally fine but then for you to be so venomous towards right. those that maybe chose to opt out of that that are healthy young and fit where the fuck are you at yeah. where are you at where where's the sorry or my bad like do you yeah. guys remember the white house the official like, sorry about overreacting do you remember the white house had like their official statement when it was going into the winter of i don't know what it was 2020 or you know right afterwards and it said something like, you know, for those of you that are vaccinated, literally the words were something like, for those of you that are vaccinated, oh, yeah. hope you have a great Christmas. Those that aren't, you're going to have a, a yeah. winter of death winter and suffering. Winter death. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, It's man. like the craziest yeah. propaganda Holy I've shit. ever seen, dude, in our time. What is wrong with I you? I mean, they were doing, I mean, they, to me, they were they were doing, they knew what they were doing. I mean, they were, they were selling, man. They were selling. There, there's enough. Can I say something, though? I'll tell you right now. You put all your faith in these morally bankrupt yeah. leaders. Because like, I, I base so my opinion on me. accepted data, because you can go and the direction and uh if i'm saying if okay if it comes out that the risks associated with the vaccines for groups of people who are forced to get vaccinated a lot of people were forced essentially by their jobs and mandates and all that kind of stuff if it comes out that the that it was a net negative okay meaning the risks outweighed the potential benefits so you got all these people who were forced to do it if that data ever really comes out the governments of the world will never never stop pushing propaganda in the opposite because that could potentially mean massive civil unrest. When you push people through mandates and laws, and then later it comes out that you hurt potentially a lot of people, that could come back on you big time. So it's they have every incentive to never, never accept any of that data if it ever comes out. So that's just all, that's what I'm going to say. So maybe two, three generations from now, 
well, we could get potentially the truth, but I don't trust them as far as I can throw them because I, it, I don't think it, it matters even if it comes out that way. I think they've already spun that narrative to, you know, we did our best at, with what we knew when we knew it and what what's happening now. That's the part that, that and they'll stick to that. They'll stick to that storyline, no matter what the, the outcome of all this investigation, all that stuff, that will be the, and that's even the defense that I hear of some of the people that are still kind of behind all of it that are just like, well, you know, we, we, this is what, so what we're saying. You did a terrible job. Yeah, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, that's oh, whoops. Yeah. You know, like we should have done better. Yeah. No, it was. Uh, I, I look. I don't. I don't care that we had to do something. I don't care that there was emergency use because of the circumstances. I don't care about any of that. I care that you ostracized and silenced people. That yeah. you influenced private companies to do so. That's proven, and that you created mandates. So if a private company wanted to fire people for not being vaccinated, that's your business. But if a private company was forced by government laws, that's a big problem. Yeah. Um, that's what I care about. But the fact that they, look, no. that's the way it should be. Yeah. If we have a pandemic, we should have an opportunity to push things through because potentially this could you know, save a lot of people. Yeah, I, I don't disagree that. with it. It just shows with me that. any power dynamic, no matter what it is, needs pushback. Yeah. Always, yeah. always, always. You can't stuff out criticism just because it conveniently doesn't fit within the way that your perspective is being portrayed. Yeah, You need to always allow the pushback because guess what? Sometimes you're wrong. Yeah, It is hard and it sucks and it stings, but we need to realize that you can be what's, wrong. What's right? weird was, I mean, just this, I think this was a great study in human behavior because- you could see how tribal people got like it, it became, how weird is this wearing a mask was became equivalent to a MAGA hat. Like if you were wearing a mask outside, you could, you, you people would assume they knew your politics and kind of how you were. Like yeah. if you had a MAGA hat on, mm -hmm. how strange is that? Yeah, right. Yeah. How strange is it that people were advertising they did an incredible job. their medical choices yeah, um, and then ostracizing those that didn't make the same choices. Yeah, yeah. That's all human behavior. Very interesting. Yeah. And, I, and, and it's not going to change. Human behavior never changes. So if, if people are like, oh, we'll learn a lesson. No, no we won't. Speaking, just, of just bullshit, won't speaking of bullshit, Doug, I'll transition us out of here for you. Um, Thank you. Did you see? Just sweating over there. Yeah, I could see. I could see him like, oh, let's look watching his watch. It's been seven minutes now. You guys talk about this. I'm <laughs> <laughs> moving along. Uh I did you guys see that Logan Paul just signed with the UFC his fucking trashy prime drink? Wait, hold on. Did he sign to fight or his drink? No, his drink. They are now the official drink of UFC. Oh my god, prime. he is such a smart. Like he he yeah. has weaseled himself in. Yeah. So have, haven't they had like a beef going on forever? Yeah. Ever since they created these fights? Well, and I know J his brother and him. Okay. Yeah, Jake and and Dana. Oh, have so beef. Logan hasn't been. His... Yeah, Logan hasn't really been. Hasn't jumped on that with like Jake. I mean, I'm sure he said some things here, but he's not like Jake is like been yeah. going after Dana for the last year because he's starting his own. Right. You know, fight. who was it that signed for pro wrestling? Was it Logan or Logan? Jake? Logan. Yeah, I yeah. saw that. You say this video. He's good. He's great. Yeah, yeah. he is. He's very. That's I mean, pretty funny his, to that's watch. His, yeah. yeah. No, he's really good. I mean, the guy is. By the entertainer. way, entertainer. This he's yeah he's talented as as shit, and you know more power to him for for doing that. So this is not me hating. It's just that it's crazy that, I mean, just to go show you how important, you know, the disappointing part of this is, you know, Dana White has the the power, the authority, the money to partner with any company that, that he wants with something like this. And this is a complete, you know, PR move to partner with somebody who's got this much power as far as celebrity wise over a superior product. Yeah. There are lots of superior products in that same space that sh would be a better suit for that company as far as the, what it provides for it's the just, fighters. It's just a, it's a glorified energy drink. I mean, it says it's got electrolyte. It doesn't even have enough sodium in it. It just, it tastes good is what it is. It tastes right. really good. And, it, and it's got the power of the, of those brothers who've got, Crazy social media. That's the only reason why. I mean, when yeah. you look at uh, LMNT, you look at Liquid IV, you look at, there's like, there's like a good, I'd say four companies in the, you know, electrolyte space that are a superior product than you that prime. Efficacious yeah. doses of like what yeah. you're looking for. Well, right? especially for yeah. fighters, athletes that are training. Yeah. I mean, you, talk, you bring up the, the sodium thing, which is probably the most important part. 
for them to have mm -hmm. and because of how intense their training is and you're totally underdosing in that and then you're putting artificial yeah. sweeteners so well, it this, tastes good. So they don't have nearly enough sodium is what it is. So by the way, symptoms of low sodium, I wanted to bring this up. I'm glad you, you, you went in this direction. Weak, groggy, nauseous. Mm. So nausea, you ever work out or you ever have a client work out and they start to get nauseous? Yeah, yeah. sort of rich. Electrolyte yeah. imbalance can mm. be one of those reasons. So sometimes you just give someone some salt and they're like, oh, I don't feel hmm. so nauseous anymore. So if you're working out and you feel weak, shaky, nauseous, people automatically assume it's blood sugar. Right, that's what I would assume. Yeah, which it could be, but oftentimes it's not. It's more often low sodium. Hmm. Uh, that's, the, that's the culprit. Also- if you lose two pounds of sweat per hour, your sodium losses can become quite significant. 4,000 milligrams. That's a lot mm -hmm. when you're sweating that much. So yeah. if you sweat a lot while you work out, you, you're going to need to consciously add sodium to your diet, unless you have a lot of processed foods in your diet, in which case you're probably hitting enough. But sodium is a game changer. If it's low, so it's okay, like we talked about vitamin D earlier and exercise. Sodium by itself or electrolytes by themselves aren't going to do anything unless you're low. If you're low and then you supplement, it's like miracle. Oh yeah. my God, I can't believe how much better I feel. Look at my pumps. Look how strong I am. I've got way more energy. If that happens to you when you add element, like if you drink element and your workouts all of a sudden go through the roof, you were low. You yeah. were too low before. So do you think, uh, and Justin, you'd be a good person to ask with your boys, Yeah. Um, does Prime become the Gatorade of this generation coming up? Yes. You and think I, so? They're already talking about it. And that this, I was, as you guys were kind of bringing this up, it was reminding me of a few conversations I've had recently with Ethan, especially in that age demographic, like the 12 to, you know, 15 kind of range uh, boys. They're very, they're very much into seeing your Logan Pauls and like all mm. of this, like a social media kind of influencer people and what they're kind of pushing and promoting. Uh, and in the video game culture and all this stuff, this is where I'm getting in a whole new conundrum. It's like, I'm not having to talk to him about alcohol and weed and all that kind of stuff quite as much because I think like there's already been kind of some, uh, hesitation and, and seeing because of the alarmist kind of parents about like drugs and all this, mm -hmm. like kids kind of naturally kind of weave around that stuff. Uh, but the caffeine, like, so G yeah. fuel, so this is something like they're already experimenting with it and kind of testing each other like because they, they feel the effects of it. They're like, wow, I had all this like crazy performance. Dad, <laughs> yeah. you know, blah, blah. And he's coming back and kind of trying to describe this feeling to me. And I'm like, oh, my God, like you're are, like you're you're almost 13 or 12. Like, OK, I have to like kind of put myself back. I'm like, when did I really start drinking caffeine? Not till like way later. Like I didn't start drinking. There were like, no caffeine drinks for kids. Well, there was a Red Red Bull was around, but I don't remember how old I was no. when I started drinking. Yes, not Red when Bull we was. were twelve. Do we no, dare we dare each other for like Joe Look, Cola? Yeah, yeah, Joel. Joel. yeah. No, yeah, not twelve. It, was really You're right. You're not, it wasn't around yet. But yeah. the, what I'm saying though is like, so can you look up Doug when Red Bull actually came? Because I'm trying to figure out exactly. And I'm pretty sure I was drinking it by the time it came out. And the question is, had it been around when I was already twelve, would I have? Would I have drank it? Probably. Especially with the they've attached themselves to X Games oh, of and they're would've. So I, I probably would have. Yeah, I had Jolt Cola and we would like the Mountain Dew was another one, right? Mountain Dew. I think Jolt Cola has like 35 milligrams. Yeah, 30 or 50, 40 milligrams. I think 50, I think of, of caffeine, yeah, which it's is like a coffee. Nothing. So 1996, but it yeah, definitely. So I'm a, I'm a freshman in, I'm a freshman in high school. Yeah, and, it but it wasn't that, even so. popular in No, no, no. Yeah, it took it took like four years before it became huge, right? When they started you know, they're, they're famous for- How much caffeine but, in Jolt Cola, Doug? Maybe you can find that. Yeah, and then look up G Fuel after that because what's alarming to me is there's-, there's Well, kids. G Fuel is all attached to the video game world. They yes. were the big company that signed with the video game. And there there's kids that'll bring backpacks of it and sell it at school as like kind of a- And I know this is not just an isolated school that does this. Like this is, you know, a thing because of- that video game yeah. culture and the ties what? these kids that, have to that's it. Not, that's not what it was when I was a kid. Look at Doug found. Jolt Cola, 190 milligrams of caffeine oh, in, in the bottle. Ghost this is a 12 one. ounce can is 71.2. Oh, yeah. wow. That's high. Uh, no, that's when we it were was 50. It was no, 50. when we were kids, it was, it was, see, that's a 71 for 12 ounces. It was lower than that when I was a kid. I don't think so, bro. It was. I I 100%. 100%. They no, added what, it. What I think you're see, what you're forgetting, and this is, is notorious, and I love, never, I don't know if we ever talk about this. One of the smartest hustles in the the food industry including food and beverage is to show people milligrams. calories Fuck. 
on something that you would consider a single serving, but it's two to two and a half right, right. servings. So this is another one of those examples of something that you would look at the calorie and say the caffeine and it'd be like, oh, it's only 35 grams of caffeine. But then you would look at the top of the can and it would say there's two and a half servings yeah, yeah, per yeah, bottle. Yeah. And so I wouldn't be surprised if that's what you recall is it was probably- So you said 70 was Jolt. Is that what we Now, should, right? 12 so ounces. Now this 12 is 300. Ounce yeah, 300 is G full. And that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that'll send kids to a hospital if they're, if they're sensitive to it. That's what I was trying it. to tell them. And it's like, it's it, we, it's nothing to mess around with, you know? And it's, it, and it too, he was, he was starting to recognize the marketing around, like, even some of those, which I know bodybuilders are kind of big in, like, like candy flavored shit. You yeah. Know? Like, <laughs> you know, like, cotton true. candy and fucking. Why do you body, throw the bodybuilders in there? He's right, though. Because, they're dude, always like this, this is also. You know whose fault kids. that is? Fucking uh, Dr. Integrity's. Oh no! That's his fault. We haven't talked about him. In we a haven't long talked time. shit about him. Like in a long Jolly time. Rancher flavors and shit. He was the he was the doctor, and he's tied to bodybuilding. Okay, to prove your point, he was he's a bodybuilding.com representative, and he shared the studies that talked about um, gummy worms. And yeah, but yeah, uh, dextrose in in, yeah. In, in, yeah. in particular, right? Dextrose post workout, all the benefits with protein synthesis and the <laughs> anabolic window and all this fluff, right? All splitting hair bullshit. Yeah, but really, what he did was justify getting eating gummy bears and sour patch kids post workout because the dextrose that was yeah. used inside of them so makes me jacked so yeah so that became and that became a very popular i remember when he when he talked about that almost 10 years ago and then shortly after i remember being in the gym right because i was consistently working out before and after that seeing you know young guys in their, you know, their gym bag, like every, you know, like just popping gummy bears. Yeah, you see, like yeah. gummy bears and sour patch kids inside their bags. The, what was the name of the the creatine drink that was filled with uh, dextrose? It was like seventy grams of sugar. Oh, in one shot. Are you talking about Celtic? Celtic, bro. Yeah, oh, Celtic. Yeah, Celtic. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. I that would, was actually the first supplement. That put weight on me. Yeah, because it was 70 grams yeah, of sugar. Was plus sugar. Yeah, I know. It's so much sugar. That and is, I used to double it up. Bro, too. I, I literally felt that, myself too, yeah. become diabetic. Like, I, I would drink it. I would drink it's it and get happening. nauseous. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, it's probably why I have autoimmune issues with fucking soup with sugar. Bro, after sugar. every workout, yeah, you yeah. would smash something. Oh, yeah. Well, to, to balance it out a little, I mean, uh, in the athletic realm, like, we had big league chew that promoted you to like chew tobacco later on. Life, yeah. Right. So it's like, what the <laughs> fuck are we doing? You're pretending to these kids? Like you're yeah. Like, <laughs> Oh, look at me. Look at him. Just like you. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a terrible thing that we do. I'm going to lose my lip. Like you yeah. did dad. <laughs> I'm chewing on this when, well, so I didn't have caffeine until, or I should say consistently or as a pre-workout until I was 17 or 18, but it wasn't, there weren't really energy drinks. What it was, was the hardcore bodybuilding space had Ultimate Orange. Mm. Ultimate Orange, Dan Duquesne, yeah, who's yeah. now passed away. He would write, uh, you know, books on steroids and on like, the, you know, the black market, gray market supplements. So of course, as a 17 year old, I'm like, this is where all the secrets are, you know, how to build muscle. So he had a product called Ultimate Orange and it had ephedra, ephedra and caffeine. And let me tell you, that's drugs. <laughs> That's effective. That is drugs, bro. Yeah, As yeah. a seventeen-year-old taking it, yeah, those are real effective. And I remember being like, I just worked out for two and a half hours. Like yeah. I just crushed everything. This is the most amazing thing I've ever taken in my life. And then that progressed into rip fuel and all mm -hmm. that other. You guys just remind talking versions. about this candy and all stuff like that. You reminded me of something. I just, I just watched. I watched it two nights ago. There's a documentary on Netflix called The Pez, The Pez Gangster, The Pez. Check it for me, Ducks. Pez something. And it's a fascinating story. I love you Pez, have you. So do I. And the so, Pez Outlaw. The Pez Outlaw. Thank you. The Pez Outlaw. <laughs> that sounds ridiculous. You, it I'm is in. is ridiculous. What's the and origin of Pez? What a weird candy. Since I know, dude. Uh, do you know how? Do you realize how out how neck how big candy. they are? What a phenomenon they were. How much collectors are around oh, yeah. it. It's a fascinating story because they they would get. I would imagine deals with bobblehead like, people and, and Pez like cross paths. So without ruining the whole the whole premise of this documentary, I'll give you a little snippet of it that that I thought was really fascinating. So first of all, I didn't realize how massive of a company they were. They're oh, worldwide, okay. and they're home, been around for a long time, right? Very long time, and their home base is over in Europe. And what allowed this thing to happen was in the United States. So you have Europe with the home base of Pez and it used to distribute to all the other continents. Okay. Except for the, in the U S okay. The U S was the only place in the world that had its own hub 
and it had a it had a, a contract between they actually ran like separate companies, but they were all underneath the umbrella of Pez, and they ran theirs as almost like an, an individual entity, and they would say. What we did get to distribute everything in the United States. You can handle the rest of the world, but we decide. And so, and part of why they did that was they would decide what Pez dispensers were allowed and not allowed. And I guess that in Europe, they kind of let everything go through. It didn't matter, like, if it was something that might have been a little racist or like what? everywhere really? else in the world would let these little dispensers and they would approve oh, wow. all the designs. Hitler in the US, <laughs> in the US, they were really picky. You know, everything had to be PC, like so they went. So, what did that do? It created a, a, a collector's market for these like real rare ones. Oh, I can see that. And this yeah. dude who is like comes is like poor, has is he he's making money. The way this guy makes money originally is by he's got OCD and he is okay on cereal boxes when you turn in the um there's like remember back in the days when you could cut out the thing, you mail it in, yeah, you points. mail you do forty of them, you mail it in, you get like a hat or yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah. So on there, if you guys have ever seen there on those those things and almost all mail-ins now, they have like a warning, uh, not a warning, but a, uh, uh, what's a disclaimer or whatever, not a disclaimer, I don't, uh, for, for lack of a better word, we'll use that, that says for one, one per household, hmm. that on there, on all those, those, those labels was created because of this guy. Just get a bunch of because them? he would go to recycling places and he would, he come out and he was getting thousands of these toys shipped. Oh, and then wow. he was going to trade shows and he was flipping them and selling them. Wow. That's how he made really? his original income. Smart. And then he came across these Pez dispensers and then he turned into like, like he made millions flipping Pez dispensers what? What? from Europe. Yes, it's a great story. You have to, and I, there's dude, so much more detail yeah. into it. Just you have to show you how wealthy society is that you could actually make money doing that. When yeah. did it start, Doug? Does it say? The 1920s. Wow. It was uh, in Vienna, Austria, and it was an alternative to smoking. It actually comes from a German word for peppermint. Oh, oh, interesting. I didn't. It didn't cover that in the documentary. An alternative for smoking. It actually yeah. didn't go over all the history, so I wanted to actually kind of hmm. do some digging afterwards because I was so fascinated by this. See, story. I like. I'm a cheap candy person. I like cheap. Just the main ingredient is sugar, and nothing else. So Pez to me, delicious. I love it. Give me some Pez. Give me some candy corn, circus peanuts. I'm I didn't happy. realize what a like a circus like peanuts. a cult like following that it had, and a collector's market. I mean, bro, there's people. Okay. I want to see that paying like the thousands of thousands of, of dollars for a dispenser because they're so rare. Like they have ones that like they just they did. They only made a hundred of them or like now, that. When you guys would get Pez as a kid, did you actually load your Pez dispenser? Or oh did yeah, you just eat the candy. No, no, no. I loaded. No, you loaded. You did the whole thing. Whole thing. I yeah. never did that. Yeah. I just the, I now the I, walk around. Now the irony of that would I would within five minutes the, I'd eat yeah, them all yeah. immediately. But I would take the time to load them and then and then do that. Which is speaking of uh, of candy, you know, I, I just. So I bought some Tic Tacs. I was with my daughter, went to the grocery store, and I got some Tic Tacs, the, the, the candy-colored ones or whatever. And you look at the back of them. You know Tic Tacs per serving, zero calories? So my daughter, we're eating them, and she's looking at it. She goes, this thing, this whole thing is zero calories? Yes. I said, no. They consider one Tic Tac a yeah. serving, and because they it's less just than get under a calorie. The standard. So yes. you know the, you have, what the FDA allows, right? Yeah. So if it's under... If a serving is under five calories, it's zero. you can go to zero, <laughs> which is a major hustle. So it looks like misleading. Yeah. Which, so you know, another one that gets people like crazy is I can't believe it's not butter or butter spray. People think that's zero calorie. That is not zero calorie. In fact, that entire bottle has like a thousand calories in it. <laughs> A lot. So you can't well, multiply hustle. each serving. But, and be like, it's still uh, but zero. it said like per spray is zero calories. What's but a it, spray? Like yeah, one one pump. But who does one pump of the butter when they when they? I mean, you just dro you yeah. soak your Give food like drop in it. And I can't remember the because I did I did all this math. I remember actually I remember this actually changing one of my clients. Like one of my clients used that like on <laughs> everything because it was zero calories yeah. and she couldn't figure out why she wasn't losing any weight oh, that and sucks. then that i sucks. remember like looking at it going, all i like, do is eat all you can you know i can't yeah. believe it's not butter well this is this is how i, I like this is how i learned all this about wait. the fda i didn't know this right so i was like this this can't be right this tastes just like butter how could it possibly be zero so i had to do a bunch of digging then i found out oh fda allows you to put it to zero if a serving size is under that oh you have these tiny things like tic tac or one spray thing but nobody has one just by the way your those dressings that you see that are in those bottles same thing be it be pay very close attention to it being sold to you like it's a zero calorie thing but that's because the serving size is ridiculously lower than you would ever use and you've actually pumped 30 times on there, yeah. you get about 
80, 90 calories. They give you serving size if you're like a Keebler elf. You know what I mean? Like, this is what a serving <laughs> size What about for a grown human? It's just yeah. like the hustle I was telling you about the jolts. I mean, that was such a a, a brilliant marketing strategy because we're so did you easily guys, manipulated. Did you guys get butter when you were kids yeah. or did you guys have margarine? Did no, we had, we butter. did, we did, my parents did margarine. They thought that was, they, we thought we were being Country healthy. Croc. We yep, had the, the big, big old tub, the brown tub. We used to have that at the center of the, yeah, uh, yeah and then my mom would wash while, it out and use it for sauce afterwards. Yes, I'd dude. open it up, oh, oh mom, God. this is sauce, not butter. <laughs> you guys had actual butter? We did. And then it, yeah, then we went through a phase of the, the uh, margarine. Yeah, margarine. It was yeah. disgusting. And I was like, I hate this. And like, I remember like visibly, I was like, no, I don't want this. And then, you know, convinced her to bring the uh, butter back. See, I don't remember, I was really into dairy. I, you know, yeah, I would yeah. drink like a gallon in like a day <laughs> of milk. <laughs> and I have no problems. <laughs> Obviously. None. Zero. I, I did the I did the same thing, but I ended up with a dairy intolerance. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. Yeah. That's strange. Yeah. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Hey, sucks I'll, to be you. Hey, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> just to, sucks to be someone who acknowledges their dairy. Yeah, you know what? You terrible, know what? Though I'll tell you what, dude. Life. If you can tolerate dairy, it is the cheapest, most effective weight gain drink. You uh, milk, whole milk, bro. If you're trying to pack on know, size you and you got a fast time. metabolism, yeah. Just drink like glasses of whole milk. It's like protein, calories. Dude, my youngest is figuring this out. Man. Oh, dude, He's you will just get like grabbing glasses well, of milk. All you the will time. gain they, size. They did a study that I remember. I shared this a, a long time ago, um, where they compared two groups with, that were taking like a protein powder versus just a chocolate milk, like chocolate milk post workout. Oh, post workout, same thing. Yeah, and the benefits were like right in line. It was like crazy. So it's like, dude, if you can have dairy, I'm going to like whole milk, maybe look that study full, up fat, me, full fat cottage cheese. Like yeah. you can't beat those two things for bulking chocolate and milk cheap. versus protein. I wish you could have it straight from the muscle. teat. Yeah. What? But like, right. Out, without any, like how Adam used to drink it, the dairy. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You ever seen milk straight out of a, out of a, out of a cow? It's like blue or something. No, yellow. no. It's oh, like yellow. thick, real thick. Too. Frothy. Yeah. You got to shake it. I just it. imagine it's probably way tasty. You, you would put, um, it's warm, bro. Well, it ain't that, cold. That's a little weird. It's it's I'll coming. Wait, I'll cool it's, it down. it's it's different. Like uh, I I mean I'm I I actually didn't and of course it's probably because I've Is been it more trained. Creamy? Well, I mean think of it's this. Full like fat. you've been. That's what I mean. You've yeah. It's it's creamier. It's got a. It ha tastes a lot different. Like I remember not liking it in my cereal. Right as a kid, I ate a lot of cereal and I had it with you know low fat, non fat type of milk my whole life. And then I get introduced to the dairy when I'm in high school and college. And I tried and they would give me like a gallon a week where I could bring home and I would use and I would use it, but I didn't like it. Because you were my, used to the Yeah, because I was used to the other one. Like mm. and so it just it made my Have you guys ever you 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 can buy raw milk. You ever try raw? No, I've yeah, I've been meaning to. You can to. find it. So raw, unhomogenized or non homogenized. But milk. it's been pasteurized though. No. It's not No, uh, raw means unpasteurized. But but homogenized, non homogenized. So there's something different. I gotta I gotta look up what is different about the raw that's sold at the store versus like straight up raw that I got out of the cow because it still looks way different. It don't mm. look nothing. like Oh, that. I don't know. If, I don't know what they, they do. do. There's still a process they're allowed to do and still yeah. call but it. But it's raw. not pasteurized. I don't remember what it was. It's not though. pasteurized. It's not homogenized. So homogenization is when they take milk and they force it through filters with small enough holes that crush the fat mm. into tiny particles so that it's suspended within the milk. Yeah, because real so milk, it the cream separates. Yeah, you have to shake it. So if you buy raw milk and it's been in the fridge for a day, you have to shake it before it'll sit like like a top of the. Yeah, and then you go like this with the and you shake it around and like it's so thick it coats the <laughs> yeah it coats the, the inside of it. Yes. And what's the, the worst part awesome. about that? Right, is that when you do that, you lose a lot of the digestive enzymes. Right, and lactase so is naturally present, not a ton, but naturally present. Raw milk also. Here's what's weird: take raw milk, leave it out. Take pasteurized milk, leave it out. Both whole milk. Pasteurized milk goes sour. Raw milk does not. Raw milk turns into buttermilk. Like curdles, right? It yeah. does not become sour. Yeah. Because raw milk contains beneficial bacteria, mm. which offsets the negative stuff. Whereas pasteurized milk, it's like devoid of so any So what was, so you, you're, you're probably better with remembering the history on what, there probably was some crazy yes. thing that happened where lots of people got sick. Yes. And so all yes. of a sudden we some made a hard change. They were feeding cows what they called brewer's mash, which was leftovers from- It's like, like silage, right? Yeah, with like like we're, we're, corn mash and all we're, kinds we're, of- you know, Beer breweries were throwing away waste. Uh. They were using that and feeding it to the cows. They also had cows that were in cramped quarters, dirty. This was during the, this is like 1800s, uh, early 1900s. And the milk would come out bad because the cows were sick. 
Yeah. So kids were dying and, and people getting sick from this milk. It was a, a blue tint, like you said, because it wasn't very healthy. Mm. So Louis Pasteur invented the pasteurization process, which was to basically make the milk totally devoid of any bacteria. Now you can have this bad milk and not and not die. But if you have raw milk from healthy cows, yeah, it's fine. It's totally fine. It's wild how we we make uh, a knee jerk we'll reaction over something that happened. You know, it's illegal to sell raw milk in I've most states. I've heard that. Yeah, crazy. They make laws against it. Yeah, there were people. I could. I could. I should find this. I remember. This. I, I saw some, this a long time ago. You know, that's some crony capitalism bullshit. bullshit. Oh, lobby, it's total yeah. lobbying yeah. shit. There was a there Stuff was out competition. There's I there's vet, you can find these videos where there's a raw dairy selling raw milk directly to people. Yeah, and there's literally. Uh, agents from the government <laughs> raiding them <laughs> like, if they're, milk like bottles. if they're selling I've seen videos like yeah. that. Yeah. Dude. And Insane. these are like farmers. Like, what are you doing? That's going in all straight. Was it you? Who, who brought up the Skittles? Stupid. Oh. Who brought that up? No. It, uh, Did we talk about that on the show or was no. that uh, off air? We talked about that. Chris oh. Williamson, I believe. Oh, was it Chris that Williamson that, yeah. that brought that up? Feeding Skittles to yeah. cows? Yes. yes. I was like, what? Yeah, I'd never heard of that. Up. What are you talking about? Yes. Look that up too, Doug. That was that was the Skittles. Just find tons and tons of Skittles. Yeah. To fatten them up. That's funny to me. Because they're cheap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's too just, bad. The cows are happy though. Yeah. They were. Just <laughs> pooping rainbows. Oh, who's our shout out? Oh, I got one for you. Yeah, yeah. I got a trainer on Twitter. She's uh, she's pretty good. Um, I like her content. I couldn't find her based on this spelling of her name. So. I got it. Her, so her. She's she only McKen on Twitter? On Twitter, Mackenzie Smith. So M-A-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E -E, and then Smith. So at Smith McKenzie. Um, on Twitter is where you're finding at Smith McKenzie. Anyway, she's a trainer, really good. She's got about 84,000 followers. I like some of her content, so you can go check her out. Just recently found her. I've never heard you talk about yeah, her. Yeah, I found her. She commented on some of my stuff, and I said, do you listen to Mind Pump? Absolutely. I looked through her stuff. I said, this would be a good shout out. Oh, cool. So, Very cool. Hey, check this out. We work with a company called Organifi. We've been with them for years because they're phenomenal. They make superfood blends that make it easy and convenient to improve your health, wellness, and athletic performance. They have a vegan protein that actually tastes amazing. One of my favorite products is their Peak Power. This is a caffeine-based herbal supplement that gives you tons of energy for incredible workouts and creativity with no crash, no jitters. You feel great. It's amazing. Go check this company out. Go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash Mind Pump. Then use the code Mind Pump for 20% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Alex from Indiana. Alex, what's happening? How's it going? Good. How can cool we help to, you? Cool to talk to you guys. Okay. So I've got kind of a, a general question, and then I'll give you some background as to, to why I'm asking for me. So what is happening if someone is building strength consistently, but not really putting on a whole lot of muscle mass? And for, for me in particular, I, I'm wondering if if part of it is my family, um, we're all, we're, we're a small people. Um, my, my parents are very small too. Um, and then I also have like a 15 year history of, um, really heavy endurance training. So like marathons, ultra marathons and things like that. Okay. <clears throat> so a couple things. Yeah. Honest. So there's a lot of factors that play into strength. There's the size of the muscle fiber. Strength is also a skill. So there could be improvements in skill, improvements in how muscles are working together. There could be energy production. Like you could take caffeine and you'll be a little stronger. You could take creatine, increase ATP, get a little stronger. You get more central nervous system output. So there's a lot of things that contribute to strength that have nothing to do with muscle fiber size. Also, sometimes people gain muscle and lose a little body fat and they can't really tell. Uh, so they think that they haven't gained anything. Nonetheless, if you continue to get stronger, you can almost always guarantee that muscle fiber size uh, increases will follow. So that's always going to happen. But when it comes to strength, strength is so many different things, not just muscle. In fact, on the on the other on the flip side, you can get bigger muscle fibers and actually not be and actually be less strong. And you see this with bodybuilders versus strength athletes like powerlifters, um, or when a powerlifter switches to bodybuilding, for example, they'll often get bigger but lose a little bit of strength because they're training for muscle fiber size less, th less than the other things that I mentioned. The, so. mo the most common answer is that you are just not eating enough calories to put actually weight and size on, and but you are improving your skill at the exercises and your CNS is getting better. 
And so you're seeing that translate into more weight on the bar, mm. but you're not seeing more size on your body because we're just not getting enough calories. Yeah. yeah your so it puts a little louder. So yeah, that's, that's the most common answer. This is not uncommon. This has happened uh, many times with clients of mine. And normally it's just, we simply are not eating in a surplus enough to actually put size and weight on, but we're getting stronger and the, and the, str and you're getting stronger because you're getting better at the skills that you're doing yeah. in, in the gym. Yeah. Oftentimes with a client, Alex, I would train somebody and we would see strength gain, strength gain, strength gain, strength gain. And then all of a sudden, boom, muscle size would pop on their body. So at some point you'll see muscle, but also how much stronger are you? You're talking about being yeah. stronger. Like what, what are we looking at in terms of, uh, you know, your lifts and your training or do is it, is it nominal or is it a big change? Um, it, it's pretty big. I mean, like I said, I, I shifted from like ultra endurance training. So, so primarily just running, just cycling, um, switched over to almost exclusively strength training. Um, and so in the past year, like my deadlift, for example, has gone from 145 to 225. Um, my squat went from about one back squat went from about 125 to 175. So it pretty significant, but for, for someone my size, maybe that's, you know, maybe, maybe I just need to be putting more calories in to see the, see the muscle well, mass. Yeah, what does that look like your, your calorie intake? Um, so I just started tracking about two weeks ago and, um, I'm five, eight, about 150 pounds. And I would say it's about 2,800 to 3,200 now that I'm, now that I'm tracking and, and really trying to shovel food in. I mean, I, I know when I was endurance training, I, I know now that I'm tracking, I'm, I was under eating for probably a decade plus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's also the, the possibility that you're having a very nice exchange too. So, uh, where maybe sometimes you're a little bit in a surplus, other times you're a little bit in a deficit. So you are building muscle, you are getting stronger, but then you're also kind of leaning out too. So how do you, how do you feel? Like, are you, are you happy with the way you look? Do you want to be bigger? And are you, do you feel like you're kind of getting leaner too? Like what it, tell me. Yeah. What, yeah. Have you gained any muscle? Do you, are you tracking this? Yeah. I'm, I'm not tracking as far as I haven't been taking pictures. Um, I'm not measuring like my biceps or my legs or anything. Um, it's really just how, how I look in the mirror. I, I definitely would say I'm, I'm leaning out a bit. Oh, that's what's happening. Yeah, um, yeah bro, you got a nice exchange going on. Yeah, that's yeah. What's, what's happening is you're 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 getting you're building muscle, but you're also leaning out, and and it goes back to the calories, which means you probably have a couple days where you're like, man, I, I hit my good calorie intake, and then you have a couple days where you're like, ah, shit, I didn't get enough calories. So you lean out on the low calorie days, and so you lose a little bit of body fat. The days you're in a surplus and training good, you're adding a little bit of muscle, and then what it's looking like in the mirror for you is. You don't feel like you're getting bigger or more muscle because you're not getting bigger in size, but you're getting leaner. I, I, I would make the case you're act, you're actually in a really good place, but if you want more size than just simply adding more calories or reducing, I don't know what your activity looks like outside of the gym if you're a really active guy yeah, still. You know, the, here's the other thing too. The, the strength gains that you listed are not, um, I wouldn't expect a lot of muscle from those strength gains considering you went from ultra um, endurance training to strength training. So that's that's expected. I would expect to see somebody who does pure endurance training to go to strength training and gain 60 pounds on their deadlift or squat. I would expect that. And I wouldn't see a lot of muscle from that. I would see like four, four pounds or five pounds of lean body mass. Now at this point, at this point, pushing the calories, continue to strength train, you're going to see more muscle gains. Yeah. You're going to see more It'll size. It'll start shifting for sure. Yeah. And if your weight has stayed the same, but you lose, you've lose, you lost uh, some body fat or you look leaner, you've definitely gained muscle and, and burn body fat. So it's probably like four to four. You probably gained four pounds of lean body mass and, and, and lost four pounds of body fat or something along those lines. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And then along those lines, I'm also wondering, because I still, I still love to run and, and cycle, but I'm almost afraid to go to go back to, you know, running or cycling too much and then affect my strength training. So is there like a, a ratio? I mean, I'm, I'm really just, I'm, I'm probably doing full body lifting three to four days a week and then maybe running and biking two or three days a week. Um, and I try to keep it under, under 60 minutes. Yeah. Well, look, but here's the challenge though. You, you <laughs> love it. Yeah. I mean, you love it. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's worth a few extra pounds of muscle if you really enjoy 
and love doing it. It's also, it, it, here's, a, here's a good experiment to do with yourself because, and this is always a, a challenging predicament that we get in when we're advising or coaching people. Like, I never want to tell somebody like, hey, you like running and it's good for you, it's healthy, stop doing it. But you also are having this challenge with putting weight and size on. So if I was coach, you were my client and you were expressing that to me, I'd say, hey, you know what? The next month, we're gonna, I don't want you doing any of that stuff. Let's just mm -hmm. see what happens when we completely reduce that and see if you're you're happy with the size you see coming on. And then afterwards, if you're like, man, Adam, I did put a little bit of size on, but boy, I really miss running. And I'm like, yep. let's do it. Then we, let's get back to it. So it wouldn't hurt to run an, ex an experiment on yourself to see what happens when I cut out all this extra activity. By the way, this is a, a, a similar situation that I was in in my mid-20s when I was, well, was early twenties, when I was trying to put size on and playing basketball every day. And I love playing basketball. It was a, a passion of mine to play pickup games every day. I had a court in the gym that I worked, but I was struggling so bad. So I, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to cut out basketball for a month. Doesn't mean I'm going to cut out basketball for the rest of my life. I just want to see. And I put 10 pounds on and it was like, oh, well, okay, well, there it is. I'm, I'm burning way more calories uh, than I'm consuming. And that much activity is just too much for my goals currently. So I would encourage you just to do a, a 30 day experiment so you can see what that would potentially do to your body. And then you make the decision at the end of that, how much you like that and, and do you miss the running and then go from there. I'll, but, I'll predict that you'll miss it. I, if you've been doing endurance this long and you enjoy doing it, I, I, I think it's not going to be a worthy of trade. Course, of course you but will. I'll, I still I'll, miss basketball. Yeah. I'll tell you what, <laughs> I'll tell you what, Alex, here's another option. Uh, you're doing cycling and running. You said three days a week. Yeah. I, I would lift two days a week. Two, two full body workouts with that, I bet you'll gain muscle. You'll probably gain size from doing that. Three days a week plus that is too much of everything. So I would cut the strength training down to two days a week full body, and you'll probably see size gains from that and continue doing your cycling and your running. Okay. And bump the, and keep yeah, the keep calories consistent. Your calories, yeah. Yeah, and keep the right. calories consistent. Uh, Alex, are you running one of our programs? What are you running right now? Um, No, just something that I've made up. Oh shit! Oh well, geez. Okay, let's. Uh, let's Maps anabolic. Yeah, Maps anabolic coming your way. Yeah, Maps anabolic. Two two foundational workouts a week. That'll be perfect for you. Okay, great. Appreciate it. You got it, man. Thanks for calling All in. Right. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate the help. You got it. So I I want I wanted to wait for him to hang up for me to argue with you because I don't want to keep going with him. Yeah, yeah. It, like I, really. I don't. I don't agree with that. Yeah, I don't agree with that. Really. I, I just, think at the bare minimum, if, if he keeps keep if he keeps his cardio, if he keeps his running and cycling the same, three to four days a week of lifting plus three days a week of running and cycling is Bro. just too much of everything. Well, yeah, unless no, that, he that, cut, I, don't, I don't disagree with that's that. That's what I was. But, that's the, what I meant. but the recommendation of scale the the lifting down if and he let keeps it, the if he keeps the running and cycling that was the that was yeah, the context. Yeah, but well, I mean, but you just kind of told the guy what he naturally would gravitate. That'd be like telling me the basketball kid, like, hey. You know, uh, keep your basketball going that way, but just drop your strength training and let's see what happens. Well, like, I mean, I'm, I'm it, not going to build any muscle. That's I? that's. And remember, that's after I said you're probably going to miss it. Yeah, but I, he didn't hear that, bro. No. He's he's like, well, he, he'll hear it now. I feel like I feel like the the this is a perfect example of when people are 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 kind of teetering back and forth between two things they really want, right? Yeah. And he, for most of his life, it sounds like he's been this ultimate. What would 30 days of like cutting it out for a while just to show this guy this this experiment of what it that potentially? No, would I be? see what I see what you're doing. Yeah. I 100 see what like you're doing. Like if he was my client, that's what we're doing. Well, like, yeah, because it's more 100. percent Look, here's the deal. Uh, when we communicate to people on the show, you know, there's two elements to it. One of it is this is like a client. The other one is it's other people listening. When you're working with a client, the most effective thing you can do, which is what you did, is have the person reveal it to themselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because if you say it, it's true or false. If they say it, it's true. Right. So, yes. Now, what I the reason why I said what I said was because we're not going to, he's not my client. I'll get to talk to him again. And so, if he reaches that point and he's like, I miss it, but I still want to build some muscle, that's okay. Keep doing what you're doing, but scale down the strength training <coughs> down from three to four days a week down to two. And you'll still build a little muscle, you know, doing that. But you know, in terms of the, the the strength gains without the muscle following, you can gain, especially as a beginner, you're going to gain strength quite rapidly before you see any size. Yeah, that's, that's quite common. I also th I, I also don't know if just one dropping one day of weight training is going to be the thing. I mean, that's such a minimal amount of calorie expenditure. So the, what you're, what you're going to do is calorie wise is going to be so minimal. I think one of his number one problems right now, aside from doing too much totally, which I think we're all in agreement in 
is that he's doing a lot of cardio activity. Yeah, still. it's not for the calories. That's not why I said that. It's just too much work. He's just over. He's just training too. I much. know, but if he's still, my point is, if he's still burning that many calories because you didn't tell him to reduce some of that, he's still not going to go anywhere. Well, there's still a mixed signal, and the signal is yeah. so loud from years yes. and years of the same thing. Yeah. So you haven't really like reset. Uh, the programming there yet. Yeah, look, when I've trained some pretty hardcore endurance athletes towards the end of my career, a couple Ironman athletes and triathletes, and they gained muscle with one day a week of strength training. I had to scale it. Now, this was, of course, they didn't cut down their their other training. Yeah. So the whole point was, if you don't cut the cardio, then you can't do a lot of strength training if you want to build muscle. Three to four days a week of strength training for the average person who doesn't do running and cycling. I don't disagree. Is, 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 I don't. Yeah, you're under the assumption he's just yeah. going to keep piling that's on the cardio. Right? That's I don't. It. That, I don't. That would make sense in that. Yes, scenario. that's what I'm saying. I don't. Course, I don't disagree with that. I, yeah. I I agree with that. We're on the same page with that. I just. I think we just set this guy off on a on a on a path of in the next thirty days. He's going to see shit. <laughs> yeah. That's, what, that's what well. I mean. I, think, I, think I mean, he'll listen. He'll listen to hopefully yeah. this. It's all this about his priorities. You yeah. Know? Whatever. So he can go in both directions, but whichever one he chooses, like if you really want. to gain that muscle you gotta you know really have a halt stop and like reprogram yeah. Listen, what you're doing I, I mean, and i know i know part of like the dance that you're trying to do right now too because it does come off hearing me go like cut out your running and do that i know there's people that like freak out like yeah. that's such terrible advice that's so healthy like i'm not if it's for yeah, but if you're training for ultra marathon you wouldn't be like loading all the calories and like just purely like focus on anaerobic training right right and that'd be uh, ridiculous and, uh, and what sal said is exactly right i want to reveal to him that's right i, I want and, and you want him to see it for himself that's right otherwise and, it doesn't and, work in 30 days by the way if you're a, a hardcore marathon person taking 30 days off of that is, no. is probably going to be healthy for you yeah, so it's yeah. not not healthy and i'm not saying that he shouldn't he probably gain size just from taking time off. that's what i'm that's yeah. that's why i want him to like to me i was like that person just, just like like all I did different. I wasn't even programming well back then. When I remember my early twenties, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I was lifting like crazy. You just Not cut even, out the basketball. I just cut out the basketball, yeah. put on ten pounds of muscle. Like yeah. literally, it felt like overnight. And so, to me, it's like you just. And then going forward, I didn't stop playing basketball forever, but it really opened my eyes of like, okay, there's definitely too much. There's and, a trade off. Yeah, yeah, there's a little bit of a trade off. And so, how do I still incorporate what mm -hmm. I love? But then recognize too that I can easily let that get away because just like I'm sure this uh, who does this, it's I mean I can get lost in playing basketball and go oh I'm gonna go play one game for 30 minutes and then I'm there for three hours because yeah. I love yeah, it which is miscalculate yeah easily. which is what someone like this does if you love that endurance type of sports like he probably goes I'm gonna go for a little light jog yeah. four hours later yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> or hard you know yeah yeah, yeah. easily yeah. yeah no it's a, it's a, it's a, you know working with clients you know and for at risk of sounding you know condescending. It's a lot like raising kids in the sense that like you could tell your kid to wear a jacket because it's cold. Yeah. It's not nearly as effective as your kid not wanting to wear a jacket. You go outside. That's just human psychology. And they are like, oh my God, it's right. cold. I need to wear this jacket. So, you know, what, what you were doing was essentially that. It's like, here, try it for 30 days. And then the answer will reveal itself yes. to you. Um, you know, I'm just, I, I also, now I'm aware you said that. So I'm trying to communicate to the audience at large yeah. at the same point. But if you were my client, I said exactly what you said. So our next caller is Stephanie from California. Stephanie, how can we help you? Hey guys. Um, well, I got to say, um, I really appreciate, uh, having this time to ask my question on air. It's, it's just awesome. Uh, you guys have been an amazing contributor to, um, my, my days and your perspective on fitness and health and lifestyle. Um, you're, you're refreshing. I don't know how you guys found each other, but you make an amazing combination. Thank you accident. for Thank everything. You. Thank, Thank you, you, Stephanie. It was a Tinder. Um, <laughs> I want to um, read off from my original question as Doug had asked. And basically it says here, I am writing you all because all my life I have been an intuitive eater. It occurred to me a while ago, though, that measuring food can be helpful for some people. Then recently, you all have had have inspired me to be intentional about the idea, and I want to learn how to me me uh, measure out my food to get a knowledge, the best practices of how to incorporate weighing food to get an idea of what I eat and how that breaks down, also in macros and calories. Um, this will be very helpful to coach my clients 
I'm finding intuitive eating is not the way for everyone um, to get their results. So it's really important that, you know, somehow I can convey that to not just for, I'm going to try it, but I'd like to convey it to my clients as well. This is a good question. Mm-hmm. I'm, I, before I let Adam, because Adam is, uh, I mean, he's, he's definitely the expert when it, comes to, measure. when it comes to this. But before I let him go, I'll, I'll say this with intuitive eating. You, it, it's you, your intuition, if you will, just for lack of a better term, is going to be based on your knowledge of what you're eating and what's in the food. So, and oh, how you feel and how it affects you. So, weighing your food, measuring your food, is a part of getting the intuition or eating in a way where it's intuitive eating to where it's very, very effective and accurate. Without that knowledge. Then you go off how you feel, which is still good, but you don't have all the details. So you don't know grams of proteins, fats, and carbs. You don't know calories. So this information helps with the intuitive eating uh, type process. So it's not separate from, it's actually a part of. So I'm I'm assuming the question is in regards to things like, do I weigh my food before I cook it? Or is that where we're heading with this question? Well, in the most practical sense. So let's say, you know, you... Normally you go and you go to the kitchen and you get your food for the day. Now, putting the scale into inserting that into that process okay, and making it really a smooth process, like it's actually woven into the, the flow of, of, of basically adding in this extra step. And how do you do that without making it kind of bumpy? Okay. No, that's, you know? a, no, that's a great, that's a great question. This is where I think meal prepping is, is really valuable. Like the, the idea that you're going to cook every single meal or, or, or make it in the kitchen real time, right before you eat it and consistently also weigh it is unrealistic and you'll probably not be consistent. So anytime I teach clients how to calculate or, or, or track macros, we, we schedule a prep day in the week. So, and that whatever, whatever day that you have where you can spend, you know, four hours or so in the kitchen or barbecuing or however you want to prepare your meal, but that, and then you, and you, you do it in bulk. So like, let's say, you know, the, the primary sources of meat for the week for me is going to be, you know, salmon, chicken, and steak. I like to barbecue a lot. And so I will barbecue all of it on the grill and then I will portion it all out into, into Tupperware. And I will weigh, you know, for me, I'm eating eight to 12 ounces of meat. And so I'm weighing all that out. I'm putting a piece of it. Then I go cook a huge thing of rice and sweet potatoes. And I portion all that, weigh all of it, portion it out. into. And so now I have in my refrigerator, you know, two or three different types of meals uh, and say, you know, a total of 15 to 20 of them that are stacked up that I can, that I can pull from. And I really, I don't, uh, I don't force myself to make every single meal for the day. I, I realize that, you know, there's gonna be a time when I swing into Chipotle or I do something like that. That's not prepared. Ideally, I want my clients to eat 90% of the food that they prepared themselves only because there's so much room for air. If you eat out a lot where people make a mistake that are, are measuring or tracking macros is if, you know, half of their food is eating out and that's really tough because of how controlled, how uncontrolled that is. For example, you go to Chipotle mm. and just because you can get online and say, oh, a protein bowl at Chipotle is, you know, 600 calories. Well, if you've ever been to Chipotle, uh, you know, and you get, you know, Susie on Tuesdays, she's super stingy with the chicken. And then, but, you know, Richard on you know Fridays, boy, he's got a heavy hand. He's and, tricky. So, you know, they can, they can, they can be off by a lot. So wait, like leaning on the stats that are on, you know, the, the, the internet or on their, their board or whatever that says that that's not a good way. So you want to, you want to measure and track and weigh yourself to get an idea, but that's what it looks like. And it, before, or after you cook it, the thing that matters with that is, is being consistent. So I, I normally will cook all my meat and then weigh it afterwards. So there's oh, okay. a, so that's a common question I get like, oh, do I do it before I cook it or after? Well, whatever you decide to do, do it consistently. Because at, at, the, at the end of the day, we have to first track to get an idea of your baseline. And so whatever you're going to do consistently is, is, is the most practical way to do it. And we're splitting hairs on arguing, oh, well, after you cook it, you lose the water. You, yeah, you lose the water. And there's, you know, it's like, that doesn't matter. Like, as long as you're consistently weighing and measuring the same time. But that's, that's how I would structure it. Does that, does that kind of answer what you're looking for? Yeah, in a big way. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't even, it, that, 
didn't even occur to me to um, pre pre measure, you know, just make it ahead. And this is, and it also makes the flow of actually eating, oh, yeah. you know, you think about it one time and one clump of four hours or whatever it is. And then uh, it's all waiting. You don't have to think about it for another whatever, five days uh, and, or something and, and like Stephanie, that. This, Stephanie, this is also a great way to navigate the world. Uh, you know, if you live in a modern society, Food is everywhere. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's alluring, it's cheap and expensive and fast, but if you have all your meals set up, um, you're, you're, you're planned ahead. And so it's very easy to eat healthy in this fashion. The other thing too, is once you do this for a little while, you get a pretty good, now, unless you're a bodybuilder. So if you're a bodybuilder, you're competing on stage, you got to measure to the, to the gram. I mean, you want to be perfect, but most people don't care about that. They're not trying to get on stage 2% body fat. They just want to look good and be healthy. Once you get a good idea of what three ounces of chicken looks like, of what a medium sweet potato looks like, a cup of rice looks like, a you know a cup of broccoli looks like, once you, you can eyeball it afterwards, and you're going to be close enough to where you'll have a pretty good grasp of what your body needs. So I, you know, when I when I would track and measure, I only did it for a short period of time. Now I can eyeball something and have a pretty good idea of okay, that's twelve ounces or that's eight ounces of whatever I'm eating. I know how many grams of protein and fat is in that kind of particular food or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and from then on, I don't have to do it as much unless I'm trying to get super detailed. It, it's incredibly revealing for your clients to do this. I, I have never met a client, one, who I've made track, measure, way food, and it was their first time doing it, and they did not come back to me going, holy shit, I had no idea. Yeah, everybody. Fill in the blank. You know, I had no idea that the sweet potato I was eating was as high a calorie as I thought it was. I thought that was a, a medium one. When I weighed it, measured it, it was or, like four times the size of what I was. I thought I was. Or on the flip side, I had no idea that you know six ounces of chicken was that much. I was only eating three ounces. That's of right. Chicken. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I thought oh, I, right. I yeah, yeah, I thought I protein. Eat, yeah, I thought I eat a lot of protein because they have a you know a turkey sandwich for lunch and they always eat like a steak or chicken dinner at night. And so then their head, they're like, oh yeah, I eat protein a lot. But then when they measure it, they go oh shit, I'm not even getting half of the protein I should be. So incredible in, in, incredible tool for a coach or a trainer to give insight to your clients. And then the ultimate goal is to be, like Sal said, intuitive eating. I mean, that's, but this is laying the foundation so you can do that properly because you now have been educated on like your own habits and yeah. behaviors around food. Think of it this way, Stephanie, you're obviously a trainer. You mentioned your clients. So Think of it this way. If you, and I see here in your notes, you didn't bring this up, but you were a sparring partner uh, for boxing. So you you understand, you know how to box. Okay. At your level and skill, obviously you were a sparring partner. When you're throwing punches and you're slipping jabs and you're moving, at this point, it's somewhat instinctual, right? You know how to move. Yeah. You got the footwork. But it wasn't instinctual at first. At first, you had to like count and pay attention and move your body this way. And here's how you throw a jab. Make sure your hip goes in this p position here. And when you throw a hook, put your hand in this position. So before you could become intuitive, you had to be super aware of every step that you were taking. This is how people get to intuitive eating. They have to know the steps, count the steps. They have to be hyper aware, focus on them. And then eventually they can become intuitive. But intuitive doesn't come from not knowing the steps. And then you're just intuitive off of nothing. Then it's just guesswork or my cravings, in which case it'll, it'll never work. Um, can I ask another question? Go sure. for it. Um, uh, uh, what about when you're, maybe it's just not a meat, a vegetable and say a rice, whatever. What if you're adding uh, the oil and the other at little ingredients that go into say if it's a, a combined dish like a casserole what do you would you measure out yeah. so yeah I, the, the spices and the no. all the little ingredients as mm, well and that's no. all just the calorie no, just the big the calorie dense ones like if, if someone's using oh, okay. uh, uh like and here and honestly i actually do, wouldn't i actually didn't even this is competing i actually didn't even track my olive oil, which some some people might think that's crazy, but I I knew how much I was using, so I had an idea. Oh, okay. So I really would I would make a client just become aware, like because you might find this, and I have had this where I'm like I can't I'm scratching my head I can't figure out why my client isn't losing weight, and then I find out they cook every single meal three times a day with olive oil, and they're they're doing four tablespoons in there. It's like oh shit, well yeah. we're, we're missing way more that's than four hundred calories. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, so okay, uh, you know for those reasons, yes, but if you are you know, lightly using it to coat the pan, to cook your meat and stuff like that. I'm not, 
I'm not really worried about that, especially if you consistently eat that way. It'll get factored in by you just being consistent with your eating and realizing if you're gaining or losing. I think that those little details like that are, are a bit overkill. Okay. Got it. Okay. That's very, very helpful. Cool. I yeah. can picture this. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for calling in, Stephanie. Stephanie, are you? Are All right. You, thank you, guys. Are you currently using any of our programs right now? Um, I went and got your um, January offer. Oh, awesome. uh, so I've got a bundle of um, anabolic um, pr uh, prime. Yep. And um, I think, let's see, it's I've got Prime, Anabolic, Performant, and Aesthetic. It came in a bundle. Yeah, yes. perfect. And I'm just trying it out for the first time this month. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so, got it. Great. Keep, yeah. keep us posted as you go through it. Use Prime on your clients. That'll be valuable yep. for them. Yes, absolutely. I love it. Thank so, you. Thank you for everything, guys. You All got right, it, Stephanie. Stephanie. All right. You know, it's such a, you know, if you've been doing this for a long time like us, you, you don't even remember to, to answer or talk about this kind of stuff. But you know how many people listening right now? Yeah. That that just was so valuable because it's so basic, but it's such a big rock in nutrition. Like mm -hmm. just this, what we just talked about right now for people who are getting started <clears throat> makes, can make such a huge difference in their progress. It's very I'm glad insightful. we had that question. Yeah. 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 I want to elaborate a little bit on my statement around olive oil. Cause I know that it's going to trigger somebody for sure. That's going to be like, what? that's fucking crazy. Uh, <laughs> try and break down the math for me on how much the, the point that I was trying to make that I, th I think sometimes people really overcomplicate this process. Like, if you consistently use olive oil in your foods and it's, you know, this, and the same amount, the right? same amount, yeah. the same pour, like you're, like I said, yeah, coating the pan or you always add so much to your, you know, uh, vinaigrette, you know, dressing or whatever. Like if you do that consistently and you go through a process of weighing, measuring and tracking your food for, say, a couple of weeks to figure out where your caloric maintenance is at. Yeah. It's not a big deal. No, because it's going to be there. It's right. It's yeah. going to it'll work itself out and just just be consistent with that. Now, that doesn't mean. I'm not saying that, you know, the calories in olive oil doesn't count. It's that it's a small enough thing that you're doing and or, and or it's something that you're doing a lot of. If you're doing a lot of it, then you become aware of that just through this process of tracking everything. But I I went all the way to the level of competing on stage and never measured and weighed. Because my it was already accounted for. So yeah. to, to put it differently, if you were tracking your food and then you're like, okay, looks like my maintenance calories is 2,500. And then you go and you aim for 2,500 and then you add olive oil. Now it makes a difference. Right. But if you originally tracked it and you didn't count the olive oil and you said, oh, it's 2,500, but there's an extra, let's say 200 calories of olive oil in there. And then you go and you aim for that 2,500, but the, the olive oil is still in there. It's the same That's both right. times. It's there. Yeah. It really doesn't matter what the number says. It's all there. So That's if it's right. consistent and you're tracking and you're seeing how your body's responding, it doesn't matter. So that's, and I want I'm glad you brought that back up because people are like, well, of course you have to count the calories. Yeah, well, you, you do if you add it and it's new, but if it's always been there and you've been tracking, then it's already accounted for. Yes. All right. Our next caller is Cole from Wisconsin. Cole, what's happening? How can we help you? What's up guys? Uh, how's it going? I appreciate you guys having me on uh, and answering my question. Um, I've kind of spammed it out to all of your platforms over the last week or so. So uh, <laughs> I appreciate you getting to me. Awesome. Thanks. Um, I want to start this a little bit different than the typical thanks for all you do. So to keep it short and sweet, Sal, I really admire uh, how you articulate when educating the audience on the different topics that you guys discuss. Adam, I love how you're authentically yourself and your, your opinions are your opinions. Uh, but you also have no problem admitting when you're wrong. Justin, I resonate with you the most and uh, as what I perceive to be uh, the most reserved one. But when a topic comes up that you're confident in talking about, you jump right in and own it. And then Doug, shout out to you for managing all these big personalities. Thanks, man. Right, right on, on, dude. Thanks, dude. Appreciate that. Sure. Yep. Uh, and also a real quick shout out to my girlfriend for introducing me to your guys' podcast a couple of years ago. Uh, you guys have had a really big impact on my, how I've sort of reshaped my fitness journey for the first eight to 10 years of my fitness life. I was the guy in the gym doing way too much, beating my body up seven days a week, no matter how I was feeling. Now I'm in a place where I, I listen to my body. And uh, although I'm still in the gym, probably five, six days a week, two or three of those days are low intensity mobility type training that I stole from MAPS Performance. So thank you for that. Right on. Sounds like a keeper. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, uh, so to get to my question, I recently turned 30 and I wanted to start focusing more on just my overall wellness instead of just focusing on trying to get big, which is where I've been for the last 
10 years, I definitely identify with the hard gainer. Um, but I guess I'm just going to approach that as more of like a, just focusing on my overall strength. I know you guys have talked about in the past how even if your macros and programming and sleep are all right, your results won't be there if you have any hormone imbalances or nutrient deficiencies. So I'm looking for advice on where to start with getting tested with, or getting testing done with those things. Uh, I basically just want to do a full diagnostics test on my body to check for hormone imbalances, nutrient deficiencies, and also just to get like an idea of my overall gut health, if that's something that I can do. Yeah. Um, some things I've noticed, it's hard for me to put on and keep muscle. Uh, I've got some like low energy here and there, and then I can, I can also be moody, which I know, uh, Adam relates to, <laughs> uh, I've heard you guys talk about Dr. Cabral, Regenerative, Transcend, all on your podcast. Do you recommend that I go through one of them or should I go through my PCP? And also, at what point do I start looking at my metabolism as perhaps being too fast? Um, I don't know that this is for sure a bulk, uh, but based off of like some of the macro calculators I've uh, used, I've been eating like 36 to 3,800 calories a day uh, and I'm getting stronger, but the scale hasn't gone up at all. So uh, just looking for like overall thoughts and opinions on all that. All right. Um, I would start. So I would go Dr. Stephen Cabral. For sure. What's um, he called, Sal? What's he called the, um, what's he called the big four or the big five? What is, he yeah, has, he's he has got, a, I can't remember. There's, there's four, there's four or five specific tests that he'll do. Um, that'll look at things like inflammation. They'll look at gut health. Uh, they'll look at, um, you know, stress, uh, markers of stress on the body. So I would do that. I would also go to mphormones.com and I would schedule a uh, hormone lab test for two reasons. One, I don't think based off what you're saying, you have, plus your age, you just turned 30. Mm -hmm. You're probably okay, um, but it's a good idea to get a baseline because mm -hmm. if everything is good and then when you turn 40 and you notice big changes, you can reference back to the time you got your hormones tested and you can see where they were. Also, you could do the things that Dr. Stephen Cabral's uh, team tells you to do and see if how that affects key hormones like testosterone, for example. So if you did those two things, you would have all your bases totally covered. And then from there, you could follow the protocols. Dr. Stephen Cabral's team is going to go the natural route, and that's always the, the best place to start. Adding exogenous hormones, that is a, that's the second option. That's when all the natural stuff isn't helping you're at some deficiencies that are causing uh, declines in quality of life, in which case exogenous hormones then can become, you know, the risk versus benefit starts to look pretty favorable. But I would start with Dr. Stephen Cabral and get a baseline hormone lab test and then take it from there, follow the advice of Dr. Stephen Cabral's team, and then get another hormone test maybe three months later and see how things have, have changed. Um, but that would be the place to start. And if there's anything that you could modify or change uh, one of the tests that the functional medicine practitioners at Dr. Stephen Cabral's team, uh, one of those tests will say, will, will show you, it'll tell you, you know, what you need to focus on if there's a nutrient deficiency, because they do mm -hmm. mineral testing, they mm -hmm. do, you know, stress testing. Um, you'll, you'll be able to see how to optimize yourself naturally for sure. So valuable. I think that one of, one of my favorite things that we've got to do in the last eight years is to, to link up with both the teams that you're referring to and, you know, even all the years that I've been doing this, like every, I get so excited every time I get to actually sit down and talk to both of them because the, the insight that I get, I mean, I'm still, still learning to this day. And every time I'm, I, I get shocked or I'm, I learn something new, uh, after we go through one of these tests also, uh, take advantage of the forums. I don't know if you're on there yet or not already, but you know, part of them being partnered with us, it, we we've created two free forums on Facebook that have got, uh, their team and they're working. So you could literally go in there and ask whatever question and they're, they're very responsive. So both those forums are incredibly valuable. I know we don't promote them or talk a lot about them on the show, but um, definitely take advantage of, of being in there, especially once you go through the testing and all the questions you may have, or, you know, Oh, alternatives like, Hey, I'm trying X, Y, and Z. Are yeah. these, there something else I can mm -hmm. do to help these levels out? And they're, they're, they're an even better resource than we are for those specific things. Doug, what's the website for Dr. Stephen Cabral? Is it Stephen Cabral.com? Okay. So Stephen Cabral.com, Stephen spelled with a PH. Um, Got it. So is that different than the mphormones.com? Yes. mphormones.com, you're going to get, that's where you're working with hormone specialists getting a hormones test. 
uh, Dr. Stephen Cabral's team is all functional medicine. So they're looking at inflammatory markers, mm -hmm. mineral tests, nutrient deficiencies, and they're going to work with you on, uh, they'll use supplements, but everything's natural. There's no exogenous hormones, nothing like that. The hormone test, I think, is important just to get a baseline and also <laughs> to see how the natural changes may affect yeah. your hormones. Worst case scenario, which I don't think is the case because your age and your history of exercise, worst case scenario, you're in a position where you know the natural means aren't helping. You have some kind of a hormone deficiency that's out of range. It's causing you know uh, you know quality of life to decline. In which case, then you use you know medical treatments. But um, yeah, I would do both. If yeah. you're looking to optimize everything, I would do both. But that order you outlined specifically yeah, Cabral, is so first. important. And I wish like everybody can listen to this in terms of like, you know, going that that route first to find any underlying issue. Uh, and this could be any kind of like autoimmune uh, underlying issue. This could be inflammation. This could be a deficiency. But, you know, to tackle that a lot of times will be, you know, transformative on its own, which then you'll feel and, and experience in terms of like how your hormones will just naturally balance themselves right. out from that. So, but two, to that point of just getting blood work done, I think like having that baseline, knowing exactly where you are uh, to be able to navigate from there. Uh, so the combo of both is, is a powerful thing I wish I had for my clients back when I trained. Yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, that was one thing that I was concerned about is I don't have any sort of baseline. So even if there was some sort of deficiency, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't even know. So I think it's a good point that having that baseline for when I do turn 35, 40 sometime in the future is a good place to start at the very least. No, this is perfect. Good timing too. Yeah. I'd yeah. love to hear your feedback after you go through it. It's always, it's always interesting. Somebody who's into health, fitness, take care of themselves, your age, and then gets uh, these tests done to see how enlightening it was for them. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. That's super helpful. I appreciate that. All right, awesome. Cool. Thanks for calling in. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Thanks, guys. Keep up the good work. Yeah, I want to. I want to emphasize the um, you know doing things with lifestyle naturally is always optimal. Always optimal. That doesn't mean, however, that it's always going to work. It often does. Oh, look what happened to me. That's right. I spent almost two years going the um, natural route after I came off of testosterone, working my ass off. And I saw some, but not not very not enough for me to be like, this is how I want to feel for the rest of my life, which no. is what led me and down it, that Because the key with with using hormones exogenously is it's it's a risk versus benefit reward. Nothing's as healthy as having great hormone levels naturally. There's yeah. you can't you can't even perfectly copy them with exogenous hormones. It doesn't work that way. Testosterone, you know, exogenous testosterone isn't isn't going to hit your body identically to how your body produces testosterone, for example. That being said, if it's low, you're doing everything naturally, you're exercising, you're eating right, and usually this happens to men over the age of 40, especially if they've used anabolic steroids in the past or, you know, some underlying condition or situation they can't figure out. If it's low, then exogenous testosterone is a game changer. Um, but the natural route's always first. Always do that first, especially if you're young. I mean, if you're if you're you know under thirty, um, you, you can make some pretty profound differences to your hormones and how you feel just by figuring out what you're lacking, right? Just by yeah. figuring out the things that you need to supplement with or, or or lifestyle changes. Our next caller is Olivia from Portugal. Olivia, how can we help you? Hi guys, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for everything you do. Um, I've been listening for about a year now. Shout out to my friend Monica for putting me on to you. Right. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm an American pro volleyball player, uh, but I currently play in Portugal. During my off season, I'm also a personal trainer and I help run an online volleyball strength and vertical program. Cool. And my question for you guys, uh, it's regarding sleep. So you guys talk a lot about waking up and going to bed at the same time to stay consistent with your sleep schedule. Otherwise you kind of create the jet lag for yourself when you wake up at different times. As an athlete, is it beneficial to sleep in after a hard practice the evening before? Okay, so uh, you're, does that mean you're going to bed later than you normally would? Yeah, occasionally. Um, sometimes due to gym availability, we'll have practice later or I'll have to see my physio or, you know, make a post-practice meal, stuff like that. Okay, so there's two options here, Olivia. Option one is you can't really control the consistency of your sleep and you're sleeping in because you're tired, in which case that's better than nothing. Option two would be ideal, which is try to pick a bedtime and a wake time that accounts for this. So if you go to bed, let's say a late night for you when you can't get the gym at the time you want, it's 1030. 
uh, try to make every night 1030. So that's as, as consistent as possible. That way, when that happens, it's not a big deal. If it doesn't happen, you still stay up till, t- till 1030. But if it, if it doesn't work that way, sleeping in, you, you get some benefit. It's just not as perfect as being consistent every single day. How often is this uh, happening? In your, like, is it a, a every week, multiple times a week? Is it once in a while? Like, how often does this happen? Uh, it depends because oftentimes we'll have two or three trainings a day. And then there's one day where we'll just have one training. And so I think, okay, maybe I'll sleep in on that Tuesday or something. Um, so generally, two to three times a week, we'll have the morning, quote unquote, off. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. Yeah, if it's just like that, there's nothing wrong with sleeping extra, especially the amount of training that you're probably doing if you're tired. Yeah, there's there's not an issue with that, um, unless it disrupts Are you your ramped evening. up. Like, uh, yeah. So, is it hard for you to kind of like bring yourself down before bed after you have these late night uh, practices? Yeah, sometimes I feel like I get home and I'm just super hungry, so I make food. Then I go and get ready for bed, but it does kind of keep me up a little bit at night. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say if you can make it consistent every night, that's great. Also, if you need to sleep in because you're tired, that's not a big deal. The only time that might be an issue is if you sleep in in the morning and then that affect your evening sleep. So it's like, mm-hmm. okay, I slept in today, but now I can't go to bed. I don't feel like I'm tired for two hours past my normal bedtime, in which case now it's starting to interfere. Uh, but otherwise it's, it's yeah. not that big of a deal. Sleep such an individualized thing too. And ritual wise, like what you do to prep for sleep and all that. Do you track it all? Like, so I know that Dr. Cabral, he, uh, recommended the aura ring for this in terms of like really understanding your own patterns of deep sleep and REM and being able to get to that point. So, you know, that would be something if you're not doing to look into in terms of being able to actually see your patterns and when this, uh, happens and occurs when you have these practices, like how you can kind of make micro adjustments uh, in terms of like your ritual going into that sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have heard of the aura ring, definitely a cool concept. So I'll have to maybe pull the trigger one day and buy it. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's a a definitely worthwhile investment, especially for a pro athlete like you. I mean, you're, you're at a high performance. You're at a, yeah, such a high level that, you know, getting insight to like you, what you might be surprised is even the type of meal you decide to eat that late may affect the way you sleep. Like, mm-hmm. and, and that, that could be just a small adjustment of like, oh, wow, when I eat these, you know, high carb, you know, type of pasta meals at this time, this is how I feel. If I at least stay lower on that and eat a higher fat, higher protein type of meal, I feel way better or vice versa. Like that's, what's great about tools like this is you can, you can play with things like that and then see how it affects right. your sleep. And then you're not having to com- radically change your life. You just, you change some decisions based off of that. So too, yeah. And like temperature obviously is another factor. So you play around with these types of things in terms of like, if you can, like if you can control the climate and, you know, maybe you do better and get more deep sleep in a colder temperature or, um, you know, maybe you draw a bath or something beforehand and like calm the central nervous system, you know, whatever it is like, you know, to be able to kind of repeat that process when this occurs, I think would be helpful. Well, here, try this. Cause when you're doing your practice, when you're practicing, you're indoors, the, the lights are pretty bright in those indoor gyms. I would wear, as soon as you're done practice, I would put on really strong blue light blocking glasses. As soon as practice is over, put mm-hmm. them on, mm-hmm. boom. That way your brain starts to kind of wind down automatically. I would also immediately after my training use a magnesium supplement. I was just uh, so I would go with like uh, like Ned Mello is really good. Athletes tend to need magnesium more than the average person. And 60% of the population are already under yeah, and w- and female yeah. females in particular. So right after you could take like mellow, which has got the magnesium in it and it's got some other stuff, or you could just take magnesium like glycinate, uh, which is pretty inexpensive. Mellow would be a little better because it's got some other forms, but you could go with like magnesium glycinate right after your training, put on the blue light blocking glasses and then see if that helps with the sleep afterwards. Okay, great. Yeah, actually I've got my Felix Grays on right now. So. Oh, awesome. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. you uh, Have you played with uh, Carrie Walsh yet? Have you guys crossed paths? No, that would be pretty cool to play with her, but no. <laughs> well, you'll have to you'll have to message her and tell her that you were on Mind Pump. She's actually a friend of ours, so mm-hmm. she's been listening to Mind Pump since almost the beginning. <laughs> wow, awesome! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, good deal. We'll keep we'll kick ass over there. Yeah, best of luck to you. All right, wait. Actually, do I? Um, can I have a quick follow up? Oh, yeah, Sherry? absolutely. Go ahead. Um, so I take athletic greens in the morning and I believe it does have the magnesium. It started with a G. What did you say? Glycinate. 
Glycinate, yeah. So I think it has that. Um, so would it be beneficial to still take it after training, even though yeah. I've already taken it in the yeah. morning? Yeah, it's, it's probably not a ton. And I would anyway. Magnesium also has a calming effect on the central nervous system anyway. So and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's unlikely you'll take too much of it. So I would still do it afterwards. Yeah. Doesn't uh, athletic greens, do they have, it has ashwagandha in there too, doesn't it? Um, Does it have sure. Do you know if it has ashwagandha in there? It might. I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't think it's got a, a, like enough of the magnesium in it, but yeah, I would just take it afterwards. Uh, take magnesium supplement afterwards. Okay. Awesome. Good deal. Thank you guys. You got it. All right, All right. Olivia. Thank you. Yeah, um, the whole sleep, th she's overthinking, I think, a little bit, sure. especially at her level of training. But, sleeping in is yeah. probably a good thing. But that's the thing about yeah. like high performance athletes, like they're looking for that like edge anywhere they can yeah. find it. And so, you know, sometimes m these like sleep aids and things might actually like, you know, be something to incorporate. Maybe it is just like one of those things where you just got to kind of keep a, as much of a pattern as you can. Yeah, no, I, I think we went the right direction with yeah. her. I mean, yeah. I, I think that uh, you're right. I think it's like, you're talking about something super, I mean, your body's telling you it needs the extra yep. sleep. Like you wouldn't want to deny it of that. Like let it, you know, sleep in You're you're training hard as an athlete, but you know that we mentioned a few things that I think could help optimize her sleep. I mean, I've, de I don't know about you guys, but like what type of food I eat before bed could make a yeah. difference on how Big I sleep. Time. You but, know, it's funny. They still studies will show now this, of course, if, as long as digestion is okay. So if, if it doesn't affect your digestion negatively, so that's the caveat here. But carbs, a, a couple hours before bed, improve sleep in most people. Yeah. Now, if it affects your digestion poorly, like a lot of people with, um, you know, acid reflux mm, or, yeah. Destroy you know, me. yeah, then that's not a good idea. But for otherwise, like a, a well, an easily digestible, you know, meal that contains a decent amount of carbs, like a couple hours before bed is like great for sleep. It shows. So. Yeah. You're, I mean, you're yeah. an athlete, you're, you're trying to find these little tweaks. And so I feel like. You know, have, that's why I like Justin's recommendation of like an aura ring of like, you're just, you're so testing you see. Oh, yeah. when I eat this type of meal, I feel like this way. Oh, when I get yeah. this by this time, I feel that like, so yeah, I mean, when you're at that level, you're tweaking all these little things. I don't think it's as big of a deal though, that she has this every once in a while. I mean, that's, that's part of being young and playing sports and probably yeah, exactly. doing school and everything, you know, Bouncing exactly. Back. Look, if you like mind pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free stuff. We've got a lot of free guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me, for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique.